Good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Samrochek, Head of European Studies here at the British Library. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to European Literature Night. Um, it's the fifth year that we've held this event here in the British Library Conference Centre, and European Literature Night has really become one of the annual highlights of our literary events programme. The British Library's literature collections range from literary archives to sound recordings and a vast array of printed fiction, poetry and drama and critical texts about them. Whether you're looking for one of the only three surviving copies of the first edition of the 15th century Catalan romance Tiran Le Blanc, um, early editions of Goethe in the original or translation, or a 21st century graphic novel version of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, you will find them here. Through our events, exhibitions and our website, we aim to make the most of the expertise of our curators to inspire the widest public and bring our extensive collections to life for new audiences. We're also involved in a number of collaborative projects exploring literature in translation. So I think all this makes us, the British Library, a natural home for the London celebration of European Literature Night. <coughs> Tonight, we're going to have the unique experience of listening to eight outstanding writers from around Europe discussing their work, and then there will be readings. Having taken part in the selection panel and participated in an Open University collaborative seminar this afternoon with some of the writers and translators, I can promise you a really enlightening and inspiring evening. European Literature Night also brings us in the British Library the opportunity to collaborate with a range of partners who share a common goal, to improve access for UK audiences to the very best of European culture in all its diversity. The European um, Commission representation in the UK, cultural institutes including the Czech Centre who initiated European Literature Night, publishers, translators, speaking volumes who produce our event, our chair and passionate advocate of European literature, Rosie Goldsmith, and last, but by no means least, UNIC, the network of European Union cultural relations institutes. All have played their part in bringing together the writers, the translators, and you, the audience, this evening for our exciting event. Thanks also to the Spanish Embassy, who um, are sponsoring a reception to which you're all invited after the event. I just want to check, by the way, that you do realise this is a literary event. There are so many of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to ten people and a glass of wine. It's not Eurovision Song Contest or anything, but anyway, it is really fantastic to have such a great audience tonight. Um, the fact that European Literature Night, and you've heard some great speeches from, from Janet and Dorian, this, the fact that European Literature Night is taking place for the fifth time is really something to celebrate, and the fifth time here at the British Library also. Um, not least because, as has already been said, we live in shockingly Eurosceptic times, and I really I feel incredibly strongly about this. European Literature Tonight is a cultural vote for Europe. Um, for tonight, at least, you are in Europe. We've shut the door. There's no going out. <laughs> um, what we've witnessed over the last five years is unfortunately only 1.5% growth, I'm, but um, I feel a bit embarrassed it's not a bit more. But um, we have witnessed a phenomenal growth, really, in, in interest um, in international literature. And there's been much more translated, much more published. Um, there are figures to support all this. I'm a journalist. I should give you statistics all the time. But um, this is our precious literature. Uh, th uh, last year, we had three of our writers were long-listed for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize. And this year, of our eight writers, every single one of them has won major prizes in their own country. These are really major writers. We should have an evening for every single one of them. You're going to hear tonight from eight writers. Now, what we do with European Literature Night, it champions the best contemporary European literature in English. It's not a competition. There are no prizes. And the main criteria are very, very simple indeed. Excellent literature, excellent translation, and let's hope excellent entertainment. Um, <laughs> no pressure. Uh, <laughs> 
you can sing and dance too if you like, if, if that's the way to do it. Um, we just very, very quickly about the selection process. So I don't want you to think that I just sat down in a drunken stupor and say, yeah, I'll like that one and that one. Um, this is actually teamwork. We have um, a group of judges. Um, I'd like to thank Christian Jensen, who hasn't been thanked yet, and also Janet and um, Renata Clark as well, who's been fantastic. Um, speaking volumes, and the one and only Daniel Hahn, who I know is here. Um, Danny is, and, and all of us, we were all judges um, for this particular event. We had, for the first time, we started in November, in January, a call went out for, to all the publishers and agents and so on for their writers, um, and we had 69 extracts. We read every single one of them. That was 20 more than last year, and that's from um, all 27 participating countries. And then in February, thanks to Free Word, Free Word Centre, we sat down um, for at least four hours and a, with a packet of biscuits, and, um, and we whittled the 69 down to eight. It was incredibly difficult. Um, tonight's eight writers are true stars. They're all famous in their own countries, and after tonight, they should be here too. And if not, you're at fault. Um, each writer here will talk to me um, about their work in English at the end, um, and there'll be some readings at the end. There'll be books out there and authors to chat with, and, um, and you can talk on your phones whenever, and a glass of wine. Now, we have, th we have um, three regions or countries for the very first time um, this year, Slovenia, Catalonia, and Turkey. Yes, we have Turkey. Um, we will talk about that. We have Belgium and Netherlands. We didn't want them to fight for supremacy, so we thought we'd just have both of them. Um, and we have the consistently brilliant um, Czech Republic. It must be something in the beer. We have them every year. Um, we begin, though, with Germany and Austria, and we definitely don't want them fighting. Um, now, first of all, um, we're going to start with uh, an absolutely incredible book. Um, for all the judges, this book was a no-brainer. It's a remarkable book. It's a seamless knitting together of stories, characters, and plot. It's set in Berlin just after the fall of the wall, it's a stream of consciousness. It's a family saga which doesn't miss a beat. It's funny and fluid. It's short and bittersweet. It's a dream translation, thank you to Jamie Bullock, of a modern German classic. Welcome to Birgit van der Becker um, from Germany to talk about the Muscle Feast. Birgit, it's a great honour to have you here. Um, you wrote this book a long time ago, 1989, 1990. It was published in Germany. It's thanks to um, our publisher here, Pyrene Press, that it's finally been translated into English. Um, how does it feel to go back so far in time to, to reconsider that novel? Well, actually, it is not going back, back because this uh, first book did never leave me. It's always with me. And why is that? It was, your, it was your first book, so it was obviously very special for that reason. It is very special. Um, it is an astonishing phenomenon um, called Ever Eversella <laughs> in Germany. <laughs> called Eversella. Oh, an Eversella. It's, 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 it's also it's a bestseller, and it sells. No, it, it sells it's, all the time. Yeah. It's out of history. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Nobody knows why. Yeah. Maybe because it's a very good book, but um, I'm feeding you the lines here. <laughs> I can say it. Now, t tell, us, tell us a little bit about your background. You wrote, you wrote this book, as I say, it's the first, your first novel. You've written many, many since then. Um, and, but this one was very special. It captured a moment in time, 1989, the wall had just fallen. Your family... No, it has not yet fallen. The wall, it had not fallen? No, it Te tell us, before. Tell us about the, the premise of this book, the background well, of this I book. Well, I wrote this book in August um, 89, before the, mo uh, the wall fall. Um, where were you when you wrote it? In Frankfurt. But it was a special situation. I, I would call it a, an historical gap. Everybody knew that something would happen in Germany, but nobody knew what. And it was in a nervous um, atmosphere. Um, the people in the east uh, started um, to 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 go to, to go to farther move. east, and uh, we all they they started their uh, demonstrations on Mondays, and we all 
feared a bit that um, the government would choose the um, Chinese solution. Crackdown. We, yeah, crackdown, violence, and so so everybody was was um, yeah in a gap. And then, um, well, I I wrote this text in three weeks. Now, your family originally came from the GDR, yeah. but you were quite young when, when you came five over. Five years old. You were five years old, mm -hmm. but you were watching it. Were you watching it as, did you feel, as, as an East German at that time? Or? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. yeah. I, I, um, I, my own experience would not, was not so, so lucky. Um, and I was afraid when the East would become West, this would be a collective uh, um, problem. Now, what made you write this particular book with this particular subject? It's, it's a novella. It's a very short book. Um, but it's, it, it's perfect. All my books are short books. All your books are short books. <laughs> but that's obviously, you started off doing that and you've continued doing that. So it's, about, it's called The Muscle Feast uh, or in, in, The Muscle meal in, mm -hmm. in um, the correct English, but it's uh, das, um, das Muschel Essen yeah, mm -hmm. in, in German. Why, why mussels? And why was it a meal? It's a family meal. Tell us about the, the actual book. Well, it's, the mussels um, are a perfect metaphor. Mussels are a met yeah. metaphor. A metaphor. And I don't know uh, why it was a perfect metaphor, but uh, it it is evident. <laughs> I, th I think people think that Germans eat a lot of mussels. No, not at all. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. In Cologne, but not in, Cologne. But oh, not in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there you are. You have, you, you, the, the, the book starts off where you have the mother who has been, I mean, it takes place in just, in just um, a few hours, four hours. This four book. hours. And it is, it is like one long continuous sentence. And the mother has been washing the mussels individually in the bath, um, and they're very, very difficult to wash, as, as you know. And they, there are two teenage children, a boy and a girl, and they're waiting for the father to come home. Now, d tell us about the father, because he's a very special figure, a very interesting man. Well, he's absent. That's the main... Uh, but it's all about him. He's not there at all, all about but him it's all and, about him. Um, he's, uh, in the beginning, he seems to be the perfect father, and uh, the muscles are prepared to... Uh, to, to celebrate, have a feast, his, to celebrate, celebrate his homecoming. Yeah, but he's absent, and uh, if the evening um, becomes later and later, um, the family, the, the three, uh, three persons, um, start telling uh, stories about the father and about this perfect family they are. And uh, it turns out that uh, it's not such a perfect father, and in the end, um, we have four hours um, to destroy this perfect family. So basically, the, 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 basically the image of... No, nobody eats the mussels. It's important. The mussels sit there on the table, yeah. um, cooked. You're around the table, and the mussels are uh, on the table. The father is not there, and three persons destroy a family. I mean, it is actually, it's a tragic book in many ways. You tell it with great humour and, and uh, beautiful language, but it is, it's the story of a it's, terrible man, an uh, awful man. Yeah, but it's a terrible story, but it's the story you can um, laugh out loudly when Absolutely. you read it. I, I, I laughed out loudly when I wrote it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's got some fantastic phrases in it, but this man is, he's a bully, He's a tyrant. N nothing can please him. His children don't make him happy. He criticizes his wife. I mean, where did you find such a man? Did you know such a man? Well, no. <laughs> no. It's pure in it's invention. Pure, pure imagination. Yeah. With, with, what were you trying to say, though, with this book? Because it's not just about this small family. It's about... It's a tyrannic system. And um, these three persons destroyed, yeah. but without any hope for a new system. So it's, uh, it's tragic. It is tragic. Mm -hmm. you, know, you said something, there's something on the back of the book, I think, about um, you know, how, you say, how interested you are in, in how revolutions start. Now, this is, you'd think when you read this book, it's just about a family, because you hear all about, the, you hear about their lives and less about politics and so on, less about the location. But you say it's a political book. 
Yeah. So just tell me a little bit more about that, because obviously in that particular time in Germany... Yeah, and in this August, I, I asked me how revolutions f can function, can, can work. And I had to to work on a family story because I didn't know what would happen in the in our land and our country. And what do you think about what's happened? It was nearly <laughs> nearly 25 years ago. Uh, it's tragic. It's tragic. Yeah. Have you written about this topic in in other books? Because of course mm. we have the one one book in English. Only. Yeah, I'm I, I'm always very close to 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 the German um, events. Mm. And you live in France, is that yeah. right? So you can observe it even more. Uh, I, more. I like to have a thousand kilometer distance. <laughs> <laughs> now, Birgit, you're going to um, read for us um, from, from this book. Um, now, this is um, The Muscle Feast. As I say, it's been translated by Jamie Bullock and it's published by Pyrene Press. So it's nominated by Pyrene and um, Birgit van der Beek is going to read. I present you The Muscles. The noise came from the pot, and as I glanced over, I couldn't help looking at the clock, too. It said three minutes past six, and at that moment, my mood changed abruptly. I stared at the noisy pot, and although I knew that the muscles were still alive, I didn't know that they made noises in the pot, because I was never around when my parents cooked muscles. Initially, I wondered whether the noise was coming from somewhere else, but it was distinctly coming from the pot, and it was distinctly strange noise, which made me feel creepy. We were already twitchy and nervous, and now there was this noise. I stared at the pot, and I stopped cutting the potatoes into batons because the noise was driving me mad, and the hair on my arms stood on end. This always happens when I get a creepy feeling, and unfortunately it shows because the hair on my arm is black, so now my mother could see that I was spooked, although she didn't realize the cause was the, was the noise of the muscles from the pot. As for her, it wasn't a strange noise. Can't you hear anything? I asked. Listen. It's the muscles, my mother said, and I remember saying, isn't it awful? I mean, I knew that they were still alive. It's just that I'd never imagined that they would make that rattling noise with their shells. I'd imagined they'd be cooked, eaten, and that was it. And my mother said, they're opening up, and then the entire heap of muscles will start moving. How horrible, I thought. The entire heap of muscles will move because they are opening. Of course, I didn't empathize with them. I do eat them, after all, even if I don't particularly care for muscles. And it's obvious that they are alive beforehand and not alive when I eat them. I eat oysters, too, even though I know that they're still alive when I eat them, but they don't make that noise. <laughs> Actually, I was kind of angry at the muscles for opening instead of lying silently in a heap. I said, don't you find it obscene that they open and make that noise obscene and indiscreet? <laughs> but at the same time, I probably thought it was indiscreet because we were going to kill them. I'd rather not have had to think about the fact that they were alive beforehand. When they are lying there, jet black and closed, you don't really need to imagine that they are alive. You can pretty much regard them as objects, and then there's no problem tipping them into boiling water. But if you consider that they are alive, then it's creepy. If we were to cook them now, I wouldn't be able to stop thinking that we were killing them. Although I found the muscles creepy, I went over, as I didn't want to be cowardly, and they looked revolting, lying there, some opening slowly, fairly slowly, and then the entire heap of them started to move with this rattling sound. Unbelievable, I said, how revolting these creatures are, gasping, as instead of seawater, they get air which they can't breathe, and they are also being scalded in the boiling water, and then they all open, which means they are dead. The thought suddenly occurred to me that maybe it was only revolting because I knew we were killing them. Maybe it wouldn't have looked so disgusting otherwise. I remember having seen half-opened mus muscles on the beach without feeling anything. I even threw some of them back into the sea, not on, not out of any real pity, and not all of them, just for fun. 
Anyway, I didn't find them creepy or revolting like these others here. My mother and my brother cut the last few potatoes into batons, acting as if they hadn't been listening. And finally, I said that if you knew someone was going to die in an hour, let's say, do you think you'd find them revolting? I'm positive you would, simply because you knew, and it would be even worse if you had to kill them yourself, like we were killing the muscles. Such thoughts plunged me into a real, really morbid mood, while the other two acted as if they weren't listening. It's mass murder, I said. All of them at once, at the same time, by boiling water, the muscles got me so worked up, the muscles had created a morbid atmosphere in the room. It's unbearable, I said, to which my mother replied sternly, what are you talking about? <laughs> It is actually a very funny novel as well, too. There, and the, the, one of the things I love, too, is another um, passage about the all-German stamp collection. Um, do read it. You'll find out what I mean. Um, we're going from a turning point in 1989 to another turning point, um, the end of communism in Germany to um, the end of communism in the Balkans in the early 90s. Um, our first two guests are both looking at um, similar turning points and the impact on um, so-called ordinary people as they go through these struggles. Austria's literature has featured in all our <laughs> European Literature Night um, events um, over the last five years. And tonight's Austrian offering, Winters in the Sun, is a riveting novel. It's a dissection of a marriage, um, it's a father-daughter relationship, and it's also about war. Norbert Gestrein has been awarded the Alfred Döblin Prize and the Uwe Janssen Prize, and these are major prizes in, in the German-speaking world. His first novel in English in 2002, which was aptly ent uh, entitled The English Years, was described by none other than W.G. Seebald, or Hale, of course, um, as an exceptional piece of prose fiction, and his second novel, I can absolutely guarantee, hand on heart, is also exceptional. Welcome to Norbert Gestrein. I actually mean it when I say these things, by the way. <laughs> I really mean it. Now, it's, I, feel em, I feel embarrassed that we've not had you here before, but I'm so pleased that, um, that um, we've, we've finally got you here at European Literature Night. Now, you, you are an interesting species because you were a mathematician, were you not, at some point, and you became a writer. Uh, I, w I was not a mathematician. I studied mathematics studied and... Uh, <laughs> That was it. I, it I tried to become one, and I wanted to become one. And, and uh, before I had the chance, uh, I wrote my first book. And that was an alternative. I don't know if it was the right alternative, because I never worked as a... I tried to find out, yes. <laughs> no. And it's, 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 uh, by the way, it's nothing uh, uh, very special. There are lots of uh, mathematicians uh, or scientists who turn out to be uh, writers in the end. So it's it's, it's not true. just me. It's there true. are a few there are few others. Yes, we can. Uh, we can, I think somebody might have done a thesis on this. I'm sure. Um, now we know you buy two books in English. Now you've written many more. Um, are these? Are you happy that we know you through these two books? Are these two books that you're particularly proud of? They represent what you feel strongly about in writing. I don't know. I'm always in the future. I'm always in a new book. I'm always in the unpublished books. Mm -hmm. These books are all gun books to me, and things happen to them, and I watch things happening happening to them, and I can't choose. So my English publisher decided to take <coughs> these books, and I think it's it's a good decision. How does how does it feel though when you have to um, when you come in and you discuss this book, which is for us a new book because it's in English, and we're talking about it for the first time? I mean, does it feel like a new book in any way to you? Uh, it does because I've, I've read it in a new language. I've read it. You've read it in English. Uh, in, I've read it in English, uh, and it's a different book. It's not uh, my language, and it's a foreign book. I like uh, to read in the English language because it's a totally different kind of reading to me. 
when I read in German, I always look how is the writer doing it. And when I read in English or in another foreign language, I read uh, like I've read as a child or as a youth. And it's, it's, much, it's much more fun uh, to read in English or in a foreign language than to read uh, in their own language. And you also have um, wonderful, two wonderful translators um, of this book, Anthea Bell. Yes. And Julian Evans. So, I mean, that's, um, you're very lucky indeed. I am, and uh, Julian is here and he's going he's to do going the to reading. But and so first, I'm, I'm going to make you work a little bit harder for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm <laughs> very lucky, of course. <laughs> you, you are indeed. You could have read it too, though. <clears throat> um, your English is wonderful. Now, you, you are um, sort of representing Austria here <laughs> in a kind of Eurovision song contest kind of way, but um, <laughs> <laughs> representing Austria. I'm not going to make you sing the Austrian song because it is the Eurovision song contest this week, of course, as you all know. Um, but um, obviously writing about Vienna is not enough for you. Um, in this particular book, you write about Argentina and Croatia and Austria. I mean, you're a traveller, aren't you, really? I mean, you, you travel a lot, you do a lot of your research abroad as well. So, but but Austria is always there somewhere, isn't it? Uh, Austria is there somewhere, but I uh, live outside of the country. I've, I've been living for about... Uh, like for the last 20 years, I haven't been living in Austria, more by chance than by a decision, but it's good to have 1,000 kilometers, the same <laughs> 1,000 uh, kilometers as uh, uh, Birgit van der Becke, because um, it's a good thing not to care too much about the day-to-day -day things, mm. especially the Austrian day-to-day -to -day things. <laughs> I, I don't like to read Austrian newspapers. No, I'm always glad when I don't see them. And when I'm in the country, I'm, I read them, and I don't like to read them. You have a, you have a, a journalist as one of the main characters in this book, um, an Austrian journalist, but I don't think you like him very much. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't come over as being a favourite character. No, he's, he's quite uh, self-obsessed. Uh, the novel is the story of a father and a daughter. The father uh, who has fled from Croatia after the war, uh, he's a fascist paratrooper and he went to South America and the daughter went to Vienna before the end of the war and got married to this journalist who is a left-leaning, a leftist journalist and who uh, confronts her with her family history and uh, the way he does it I don't like because it's the uh, Daniel Goldhagen way. Mm if you know what I mean. Yes, indeed, I'm sure. Uh, like you could uh, inherit, uh, like you could inherit being a fascist, and of course, that's nonsense. So the main characters are Maria, the daughter, and the old man, you call him her father. She doesn't know initially that her father is alive. He was, as you say, he was a fascist um, in the Second World War, yes. and then went to Argentina and built up a new life in, in Buenos Aires. Um, and then when the, um, the, the Balkan Wars, when Yugoslavia um, begins to break up in the early 90s, that's when he sees his moment, doesn't he? What, what is it he wants to go back and do 50 years later? Uh, it's, it's also a novel about frozen time. He thinks he can go on with these crazy uh, political thoughts. He's in his the, 70s, though, isn't he? He's 70, uh, though he has some money and he thinks he can uh, spend money in the new wars. And there have been people, there have been people from Croatia in uh, overseas countries in Northern America and Southern America who spent, uh, who gave money to the new wars in Yugoslavia. And he's one of these uh, characters. And there was a small chance that these um, political crazy ideas could have been implemented again. I was thinking about uh, a character who had some uh, fictional credi credibility uh, thinking these thoughts. No Austrian, no German uh, could think uh, seriously of implementing a Fourth Reich. But in Croatia, it was a serious, even though a small possibility, it was a serious possibility to think. Why did you choose uh, Croatia and, and I mean, why these particular parts of the world? What was it that fascinated you about, about, the, about Yugoslavia at that time? Um, I had another novel about Yugoslavia and about the war there, about the wars there, and about how you can write about war. Uh, the German title is Das Handwerk des Totens, a novel which I think my publisher should have published. 
uh, in English because your <laughs> so it's your, your first here. question. Your uh, publisher's uh, here, so we can because um, uh, for me, uh, for my for my writing and for my development as a writer, it is a very important uh, novel, though it's uh, considered to be a complicated novel, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it's not uh, translated. It's a novel in which I try to think how you can write about war. And one of the starting points for this novel, and all, then also for the second novel about Yugoslavia, uh, uh, was that one of my friends uh, was killed in uh, Kosovo at the end of the war there. He was a, a journalist uh, working for a German magazine. And I started thinking, is it morally possible to take the death of a real person and take this as a starting point for a novel. And actually, it was a big problem in Germany. It was a big or maybe small scandal that I did this. Yeah. Now, th the fact that you write about war, and war is very central to, to your, at least the novels you've been talking about, um, in a way, I want to sort of also emphasize the fact that these are incredibly um, private, personal stories. These are not, you're not just going out and describing battlefields. You're describing how war and struggle actually impact on, on the people, on the daughter, Maria, um, who goes out to, um, to, to Zagreb to try to, to find herself, um, but also to uh, try to understand her marriage and eventually um, possibly meet up with her father. I mean, these are incredibly intense emotional novels. Um, it's, it's uh, this novel, uh, Windows in the South, is more about the uh, impacts of war on private life than about war itself, about the impacts uh, on the life of Maria. And there's a motto at uh, the beginning of the novel. Uh, and the motto is, it's war, baby, it's war. So it's somehow the story of a woman who comes in between two wars, the Second World War, represented by her father, and the uh, wars in Yugoslavia. Well, let's um, hear um, a reading from this um, remarkable book. Um, Julian Evans, who is um, one of the translators of the book, is going to read a passage for us. Thank you. This is um, Winters in the South. It's translated by Anthea Bell and Julian Evans, and it's published by McLehose Press. And I'd like to say happy fifth birthday to McLehose as well. Hello. This is um, a symphonic novel. At least I found it a symphonic novel. And um, these are the opening bars of a book of many, many themes. It was in her second month in Zagreb, in the autumn the war began, that the news reached Maria that made her life foreign to her forever. She hadn't set eyes on her father for more than 45 years and had thought he was dead for almost as long. So at first, she didn't react at all to the advertisement that the neighbours had left outside her door and that couldn't possibly have been from him. There had to be some misunderstanding, even though when the same thing happened again a few days later, she hurried down the street, bought a copy of the paper at a kiosk, unfolded it in the teeth of the wind, and with a feeling that objects around her were losing their outlines and blurring shapelessly together, <coughs> stared at the not especially large boxed ad in the middle of the miscellaneous section. A week went by in which she did nothing but felt constantly uneasy. And then, when she finally came across a further advertisement as she sat one day at a cafe table, tears immediately welled in her eyes and she looked around to see if people at other tables were watching her and had noticed what was happening. In December the previous year, she'd had her 50th birthday. She and her husband had spent a week on Elba and his clumsy attentions there had made her suspect that, once again, he had a lover. In the middle of the day, she sat with him, swaddled in a rug in the sun, and looking out at the sea, didn't know whether she could smell it in the damp air or see it far away at the line of the horizon, or hear it, but as hard as she tried not to give in to gloomy calculations about her birthday, it was at that exact moment, as time stood still, that she realized how fast it was flying by. Although at home they'd slept separately for a long time, for these few days they took a double room. And in the end, she decided to reward his efforts to show her how much he still desired her, bent over him, 
with quick motions of her hand, brought to life the dormant worm she'd once summoned like a snake charmer, like a snake charmer, by the tenderest nicknames, and only stopped working on him when, twitching limply, he came heedlessly in her mouth. Then that was behind her, accompanied by the lengthy apologies he always made when he didn't manage to come out of her in time, and the next morning he didn't know how to face her, surreptitiously casting her the despairing glances of the boarding school boy he'd once been, and joking with the young English women who shared the breakfast room at their hotel, while she sat, behind, while she sat beside him in silence and thought, how does his longing compare with mine? I could be just like those overdressed ladies and set out to explore the island in a large and completely unseasonable hat too. I could be a girl again for a day. Back in Vienna, she let a few months go by before she finally asked him, more in flattery than because she really wanted to know, why he was out so often in the evenings. It wouldn't have been a catastrophe for her to hear the truth and she watched him as he went round and round in circles, until he'd gone so far in his evasions that he was ready to hear anything she might say in reply. So then she asked him if he had anything against her going to Zagreb for a while, and was annoyed with herself for weakening as soon as she'd said it. It would only be for the summer. Robert Gastrine and Julian Evans, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, we had eight Czech entries this year. It was very, very hard to choose. But the, the Devil's Workshop, hot off the press this month from Portobello Books and winner of the 2013 English Pen Award for Outstanding Writing in Translation, is unlike anything you'll ever read, ever. And it will stay with you for a very long time to come. And it's proof for me that some of the most interesting writing and unusual writing, thought-provoking writing, today comes from the former East. It's a privilege to welcome Jochen Toppel, one of the great dissident writers before the Velvet Revolution and a leading prose writer and poet in the Czech Republic today. Jochen. Nice to see you. <laughs> now, um, when, when I call you, and, and don't yes, worry. Yes, thank you. I'll talk you know, very slowly. You know my English is poor, so. I'll be yeah. very slow, uh -huh. I promise, OK? Yeah. And um, if you want me to repeat something, or maybe Teresa can even translate, maybe. Um, just let's see how we go, OK? Um, Jakim, I can look into your eyes, OK? <laughs> we'll, yes. we'll try and make it work. Yes. <laughs> OK. Now, look, when I call you, um, a Samizdat poet or a writer. Do you feel proud of that? Is that all past, all gone, finished? When you are a Samizdat poet, you know, you will, you will, it will, you know, uh, <clears throat> I remember everything, so uh, I don't think I'm changed. You know, when you, when you write in the time of uh, Samizdat, it's the era of communism, and you are part of this so-called underground, it's only situation, it's only political situation. But I am sure that my writing is the same. So you don't write differently from underground, overground? Absolutely. No? Especially here in British Library or where I am, because yesterday I was in Amsterdam, before I was in Dublin, in the Irish Library. So I think it's overground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, probably here in the British Library, they've got books of yours from before as well. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. would be interesting for you to find out. We can ask um, mm -hmm. Janet. Because I do not write a science fiction, like from future. <laughs> I think every writer writes from the memory. Graham Greene once told that the memory is one of the most important thing for a writer. Tell us what you do write. Huh? What, what, what do you write today? You what? write novels, poetry, well, films, I think the theater. biggest the biggest thing for me is to write novel. It's uh, I don't know. That. It's challenge. It's something. It's 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 not easy. You know. Now because I have no time, I'm working and so on. I have children, small children. My parents are all blah blah. So I start to I start to write short stories, 
that is a problem. <laughs> because, because, you know, I couldn't believe in, in, in short story, because after Bunin, uh, Ivan Bunin, after Anton Pavlovich Chekhov, Isaac Babel, you know, all these giants, or Isaac Bashevi Singer. So, short story, it's, you know, you should write novel, long book, and you should, you, you think about suicide, you know, you are alone, depressed, drunk sometimes, and it's, 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 not now, and it's part of, it's part of your life. Uh, sorry, maybe short, I'm too no, no, pathetic, no, you know, you're, but no, you're it's because, because I have a small problem to understand your English, you know. Okay. When, when, I, when I have reading in, in, in Hungary or Amsterdam, it's okay. But here, I am talking too much, you know, I'm talking Just too much. Just keep talking, it's, don't it's give fantastic you time for what you're saying. More complicated <laughs> questions, sorry. You don't need questions from me, I can uh, guarantee But we are serious people, you know, it's not... You know. We can laugh, they're laughing. Um, now look, this is a short novel. Is that easier? Yes, uh, short. My, my first novel, Sister, it was published in the United States. It has 600 pages. And it's, I don't know, 12, 12 years ago. So I feel like this animal, uh, help me, lives in the river and eating uh, wood. Yeah. Bobber. Beaver. Yes, exactly, you know. So, and I am making from, from the whole trees, I am making only one. Uh, yes. So, first book, five, six hundred pages. The last one, two hundred. By comparison. Mm, well, that, that but one do you understand my English? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's don't be polite. I have, I, no, no, no. I have no education, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to yeah. do my best. No, I feel, Yachim, I feel like being here in England, mm. I feel like Jimmy Hawkins in the pirate ship. Who's Jimmy Hawkins? I'm talking about English, British literature. Uh, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, the yeah. Island of Treasures. Mm. So I feel like this small boy, Jimmy Hawkins. Yakim, let's talk though about this amazing book. Yes. Mm -hmm. This book. You've got to believe me. is an amazing book. Do you like? Do you like my book? We loved it. <laughs> every single. Uh, happy every, to be here. I we really loved it. Mm -hmm. I mean, where are my judges? Didn't we just love this book? <laughs> Make the man feel better about it. <laughs> it was. It's an amazing book. Let's talk about this book, okay? It's like LSD. It's LSD. Let's give you some more literary mm -hmm. LSD. I'm going to take you out of your misery briefly to explain what this book is about. I'll, I'll give a short description of the book, OK? Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk a little bit about it. Please. Just to give you some a breathing yes. space here. <laughs> now... <laughs> it's, it's, it's very... The book, you know, it's comedy, but it's very sad. So it's, It is very sad, mm -hmm. but it's very funny, too. Mm -hmm. um, and who would have thought it could be so funny? It is about... It's about concentration camps. Um, this is a book in two locations and two parts. It's set partly in the Czech Republic, partly in Belarus. You could not imagine two grimmer locations because the... I'm not saying the Czech Republic is grim, <laughs> but um, Theresienstadt, Terezin, which is where um, half the book takes place, is, as we all know, one of the great um, awful monuments, the ghetto Terezin. And then it takes pa pa um, place partly in Belarus, in Minsk as well where, as we also know, um, but we don't know enough about how many thousands of people were killed there. Um, and this book is about a young man who grows up in Terezin, Terezinstadt, and in the modern times, um, he gathers together groups of um, young people from all over the world who come to um, this place to search for information about their grandparents who died um, in the ghetto. He, set up, he sets up a commune um, as an alternative place of remembrance. And they have Kafka t-shirts. They produce a ghetto pizza. Um, things like this is where it is um, very funny. They have therapy sessions for all these young people. And this new project is, what is, re is regarded as very unwelcome by the official Theresienstadt um, tourist um, memorial people. Um, and the camp is then marked for demolition, and um, one of the survivors then begins this campaign to, to, uh, to save it. And then there's a crackdown, and um, the authorities bulldoze it. The narrator flees to Minsk, 
and with the aid of two, two more young people. He t all he takes with him is the key to a safe deposit box and a USB stick, storing the contact data of rich Holocaust survivors. So, and these are meant to be funders of this new project in Minsk. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary topic. What on earth made you choose this bold, provocative, difficult topic <coughs> for, for in, in a way, a comic also, novel. I, was, I am thinking that I was working about 20 years on this book. 20 years? Uh, yes, and uh, maybe, um, um, and especially from the year 1989, you know, the time of East European revolutions, I spent never-ending time in Ukraine, in, in Poland, in, in Slovakia, in Belarus, in Romania, in, in East Europe, or so-called East Europe. And everywhere I was, uh, me I had meetings with these demons, you know, and uh, it became obsession, mm -hmm. some sort of obsession. And you know, uh, I think it's typical for every writer: your tema, your topic, must become obsession. And I'm waiting for this for books ten years, five years, mm -hmm. and when it's still here, I'm trying to find time to, to write it down. So this book about ghosts or demons, of course, and when you were talking about Theresienstadt, you mentioned this, these young people. It was the biggest shock for me. At the beginning, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm still thinking about war and it's, uh, maybe I'm sick and so on. Then I was traveling into Theresienstadt and I, I was also making a TV reportage and so on. Then I, I, was, I saw there are some people, mostly young people, these, uh, you know, mm, mm, these uh, free freaks, you know, freak, and I, I find they are the third or fourth generation of Holocaust. You know. mm. and then I was looking into the books and it really exists, sort of sickness. So it was the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then I, then I, and I really was in Belarusia looking for it. It's not long, you know, no, so... But there's a lot in it. There are so many people here. <laughs> you, don't need to, you don't need to look at them, it's just you and me. It's just you and me. Um, what, I mean, in, in the end, are you criticising the, if you like, the, the, the Holocaust industry, the tourist... Well, what, 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 well, is, what do you find I am making, you know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to make some, some jokes, you know, and I write about this industry with uh, black humour, but... Mm, I am not criticizing. I, I don't know what to, what to think about. You do you know? think we should Maybe still this is the best way. You know? Do you think we should still like go to visit Like to make Disneyland from it. You know? Sorry. No, keep going. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, we should still go it's, to it's in It's because, you know, I am from Prague. And in Prague, the uh, one of the icons or, or mascot or fetish of Prague is a Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka t-shirt. And uh, these people in Theresienstadt, they have this idea to make T-shirt with Theresienstadt, just to, to make another kitsch from it. And I was shocked, and oh my, why? Then I was thinking, why not? You know, maybe, you know, it's, it's not easy. If you have, for example, ghetto pizza in Krakow, you know, it's, it's brilliant. It's black well, and it's bleak it's, and it's... The, the book is full of it, but I am not really criticizing. I don't know what to do with this. Mm. But it's, it's, it's an absolutely wonderful book and it really, it makes you laugh, but my God, does it make you cry as well. It really does. Now, we're going to hear a reading um, of this book um, and we have somebody to read an extract for us. Uh, Sarah Sanders is going to come and read for us. Um, it's... A reading from The Devil's Workshop, and it's by Jachen Toppel. It's translated by Alex Zucker, and it's published by wonderful Portobello Books. It's been nominated by the Czech Centre. Sarah. You going to read a little bit in Czech? In you want Czech, to? Okay. Right. Short, short, short part. First, okay. Just to show you the beautiful language of Czech people. A to jsem jak těživ neviděl. Z vlhké země k nebi tričí komíny, komíny vesnických domků. Všude se tu drápou z mlhy. A kusy zdí rozbité schody. Šedé roury komínů jsou všude kolem, jak stěžně hřbitova lodí. Ale je to hřbito vesnice. Jsem na cestě dlážděné černými kameny vede k rozvaleným vrátkům mrtvého hospodářství. Pojď, ukážu ti to svý muzejko, říká Alex. Ten ticho šlápek. Mám ho za zádama. 
A popadne pro vás, co mi vysí na krku, na ten jsem zapomněl, vede mě, musíme do svahu, krápe. Jsem rád, že bunda od Alexe má kapuci. Alexovi padají kapky ledového deště na ostříhanou hlavu. Tohle je chatyň, povídá. Takových vesnic tu byly stovky, tisíce, ne jako u vás. Šlo by vyvraždit ty slovany, jo, tady to zkoušeli. Vyvraždili jich akorát 300 tisíc. Jenomže o tom se u vás na západě neví. A proč se to zametlo pod koberec? Proč se o tom dodnes držej huby? Aha, protože je to dávno. Povídá mu docela normálně, protože mi teď smyčka vysí kolem krku volně, neškrtí to. Ale houby, vyjekne Alex, to se zametlo. Ty stovky tisíc upálených, protože tomu šéfovali Germáni, ale za žolt tu zabíjeli rusové, ukrajinci, litevci a dnes se o tom mlčí, protože nikdo nechce nasrat Putina. Chápeš? Kývnu. Děsný, říkám. K vám pořád přes půl Evropy courali ty zhejčkaný hledači pryčen, ty hypízácký pičusové a naivní kravky s kreditkama od rodičů a s báječnýma pasama, aby jim lebo pofoukal bebička. Tady ale hledačem úplně každý chápeš a bez kreditky to si piš. Dojde mi, že ty cestičky z černého kamene tu jsou zbudované na schvál. Je to pomník vesnice nebo památník. Já jsem hrdej Bělorus, povídá Alex. Mě ale nezajímá jen žrát draníky a čučet na televizi, ani demonstrovat a házet čutrama. Mě zajímá paměť národa. Když ztratíme svou minulost, nebudeme mít ani budoucnost. Nebudeme, chápeš? Jo, Alexi, tohle bych těch považoval za úplně nejlepší, kdybys nebyl. Tohle si myslím, ale neříkám. Nebudeme lidi, chápeš to? Budeme pořád zahrabaný se svýma mrtvýma jak nějaký démoni. Dokážeš to pochopit, kurva, rozumíš mi? Tahá teď za provaz, co mám kolem krku, to mi vadí. If you can. It's a, it's a fantastic Thank you. language. <laughs> okay. An excerpt from near the end of the book. I've never seen anything like it. Chimneys drop towards the sky out of the damp earth. The chimneys of cottages everywhere rising out of the mist. Chunks of walls, broken stairs. Grey chimney pots surround me like masts in a graveyard of ships. But it's a village graveyard. I'm on a road paved with black stones that leads to the flattened gate of a lifeless farmstead. Come, let me show you my little museum, Alex says, the sneak. He's right behind my back. He grabs the rope hanging around my neck. I've forgotten all about it. And we walk, again, him in front, leading me uphill. It's drizzling. I'm glad the jacket Alex gave me has a hood. Drops of icy rain fall on Alex's closely shaven head. This is Katine, he says. There were hundreds of villages like this, thousands, not like in your country. Could they wipe out the Slavs? Well, they tried, here. 300,000 they killed, and nobody in the West knows. How come it got swept under the rug? How come nobody talks about it, huh? It was a long time ago, I say in a normal voice. The noose is pretty tight now. It isn't choking me anymore. Bullshit, Alex yelps. It got swept under the rug because the Germans were in charge. But the ones who did the killing were Russians, Ukrainians, Lithuanians. They did it for money, and everybody keeps quiet about it because nobody wants to piss Putin off. Get it? I nod. Slovak soldiers were stationed in Oktyabrsk, where too many people got slaughtered and burned to even count. About ten of them were my relatives. Awful, I say. All those spoiled bunk seekers coming halfway across Europe so Lebo can blow on their wounds and make it better. All those hippie cunts, naive bitches with their parents' credit cards and fabulous passports. Everyone here's a seeker, get it? And you can bet your ass they don't have any credit. It dawns on me that the paths here are made out of black stone for a reason. It's a monument to the village, or a memorial. I'm proud to be Belarusian, Alex says, but I don't just want to sit around eating janiki and watching TV or protest and throw stones. I want to preserve the nation's memory. If we lose our past, we lose our future. We won't exist, get it? Yes, Alex, I get it. I wish you didn't exist. That's what I think. I don't say it. We can't live like that, bury forever along with our dead like we were some kind of demons. Can you even see what I mean? Do you fucking understand? He tugs on the rope around my neck. 
that bothers me. Hey, Alex, I need to tie my shoe, OK? I hunch over and look to see if there's a stone I can grab. Nobody's going to tell me what to do anymore. Your shoes are fine, Alex says calmly. Just come on. So I get up, and we go. Guess he knows that trick. He lets go of the rope and gives me a friendly slap on the back. He knew the whole time he was choking me. Look, he gestures grandly into the mist. We're going to build a huge car park for buses over there. Kiosks like they have in Auschwitz. Resurface the road. Oh, you think the tourists would like it more if it was bumpy? We could put in a rainforest. They don't have that at home. What do you think? Work, you cunt. You're the expert. Rainforests are nasty, I tell him truthfully. Hot, muggy, terrible weather. The tourists will tell him to go fuck off. Summers here aren't nice like they are in Teradzin. Only now do I notice that all the chimneys have signs on them. Naviki, Navika, 50, 42, 14, 5, 3, 1. Names of the dead and ages of the dead. This just isn't going to do the trick, Alex says, waving his hands around the units. Some boring old-style memorial that won't get the attention of the new Europeans. Look at the poles and that Katyn of theirs. A step ahead again. They're shooting a movie about it. And what about our Katyn? Nobody's ever heard of it. All of a sudden, Alex jumps up on a wall and shouts, Listen to me, you heroic Poles. The people who got murdered here in Katyn weren't officers who could defend themselves. He jumps down, grabs the rope, and starts talking normally again. They forced the men to run around in a circle till they got tired. Then they herded them into a barn and set fire to it. They used another barn for the women and children. Why didn't the people resist? Because Slavs are stupid brutes? No, they just didn't believe it. Right up to the last minute, throwing kids in the fire. Why would someone do that? Nobody thought it would happen until it actually did. The killers had it all worked out. We start walking back towards the tent. I learned something there in Terradzin. Alex gives me a punch in the shoulder. Oral history. The most important thing is the story. Authenticity. That's what Lebo said, right? We both stop short. Lebo, that's right. This is Belarus, my friend. No Kafka T-shirts are going to help us here. Thank you. much to Sarah and to Joachim. I mean, these books alone, the ones you've heard already, are a testament to the fact that we must be, um, we must just translate more of this foreign fiction. This, these are stunning books. I mean, I don't think anybody in Britain could have written that book, for instance, and these are topics that we all need to, to know about. Um, and speaking of which things that we need to know about, we are really delighted to, for the very first time, to have Catalan represented here at European Literature Night, and with such wonderful writing. <clears throat> Last year, Kim Monzo was nominated but couldn't make it. And of course, I'd love to do all the research um, in situ, and maybe I should make it part of my contract to go out to each country beforehand. <laughs> but, um, but unfortunately not. But um, I, I have been able to bring the writers here. Now, we all loved this novel, Lost Luggage. It's a translation from the Catalan. It's a story of identity, migration, and language. It's about four brothers... They're all named Christopher, um, and they all have the same father but different mothers, and they've never met. <clears throat> they no know nothing about each other until one day the father disappears. Now, the author of this book is an extraordinary man and writer. His name is Jordi Punti. Welcome to Jordi Punti. And this is the first time I've actually seen the finished book. So I've been reading PDFs and extracts. That's how hot off the press these books are. <laughs> Many of them are being, are being pu published just for the occasion. Anyway, welcome, Jordi. I mean, do you... I mean, let's get this out of the Do you call yourself Spanish, Catalan...? I call myself Jordi. But that's Jordi. My <laughs> <laughs> no, I call myself Jordi. Uh, I'm Catalan, and then I have my... Uh, the, the national document, official document, who says I'm Spanish, so I guess I'm Catalan, and I'm from because my mother and my father are Catalans, and I'm Spanish because I was uh, I was born in Spain. Mm -hmm. So look, um, as you are our first Catalan writer, we're going to make you work a little bit hard um, to mm -hmm. a little bit harder to explain a little bit more about Catalan writing and literature too. Mm -hmm. I mean, why is it important to have Catalan writing as as separate from Spanish, or do you? work together in happy harmony? We, I think we writers uh, live together in harmony, Catalan and Spanish. I have many very good friends who, are, uh, who write in Spanish, 
living in Barcelona, and actually in Barcelona, there are many very good. Uh, I think the, one of the mo some of the most important Spanish writers are are from Barcelona and living in Barcelona. I think it, it, they, they, we, we have to live together, and we are we are both uh, all part of the, the the Spanish culture, if you want to say it, because uh, we come from different languages, which all the two of them have has a very very long uh, story and uh, as a language as and as a literature, starting almost at the same time, like many of the other European and Latin. Uh, literatures. Yeah. So but you started, I mean, Catalan literature started to really take off after democracy, I imagine. Um, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say after democracy, of course, during the Franco years, it was banned and it was forbidden. So uh, there were some writers who were still writing in the exile and some others who were still writing in, in Barcelona or in, in Catalonia, but they couldn't publish. So uh, around uh, early 60s, um, the, the, the Franco government started to be a bit uh, less uh, strong, and they, were, they started to allow, uh, after censorship, of course, to be published uh, cert certain novels. So we would say, we could say that, yes, after the, the Franco in the democracy, well, the, the, the Catalan literature, um, had uh, you know started to spring again, but there was there is a, a big big like uh, your director here said that uh, there is a great novels uh, from the 15th century. One of them is uh, one of the copies is here from Tiran Lublin, for example, in in the British Library. In the British Indeed, Library, yes. yeah. Um, now you are um, you're a translator. You are a journalist. Um, you're a football fanatic, I think as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty big on your CV yeah, if, actually. If you are from <laughs> Barcelona, you have to be a football fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> you're also, I mean, you're particularly well known in, in Spanish um, or Catalan for your short stories, but this is a novel. Yeah, was and that, a long one. Was yeah. it hard to write? <laughs> this is your first novel. It's my first, yeah, it took me seven years to write it. And um, I well, think it's... That's nothing compared with how yeah, long Yeah, I know, like, took, when I hear years. the 20 years <laughs> thing, I think, wow, well, that's, it's like writing short stories. Um, <laughs> it took me such a long time because I... I, I realized that my short stories were becoming more and more long stories, and uh, the idea of cut them to make them short didn't appeal to me. I liked it, the idea more like blossoming stories, right? When a minor character um, gets more important, so you don't cut it, you, you, you give him more more space. And so then one day I started to think about, no, no, I should write a novel, I shouldn't write short stories, and, and this came to my mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, let, let's talk about um, Lost Luggage, and I know you're going to read something as well mm -hmm. for us. This is, um, as I say, we, we all loved it. It's, um, I, I couldn't believe that this was your first novel, because <laughs> after all the writing you've done as well, too, as a journalist and, and, and so on too, um, and I highly recommend you write another novel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and a third. But, but tell us about this one, because it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic story. Four brothers, all called Christopher. And one father. Yeah, that's the, exactly. That's the story of Gabriel de la Cruz. He's the, this man who... Gabriel's is, the father. Gabriel is the father. He's a truck driver in, in Barcelona in the 70s. And with two fellow truck drivers, they, they move furniture from Barcelona to around Europe in the late 60s and 70s. So they happen to be like accidental tourists. Let's say they go around Europe in a moment where Barcelona is a dark... Uh, gloomy city where nothing happens culturally, where there's a, of course, Franco, it's, uh, it makes it very difficult to live for everyone. And they get to be, go around Europe with the truck and they get to be in the middle of the demonstrations of students in Paris, or they arrive to, to London and they get to see the swinging London with the hippies, or they go to Frankfurt and they met, you know, all these immigrants, the Spanish immigrants who were uh, abroad to work for, for mainly for the, the um, uh, companies that, that uh, made the cars, like Opel, Volkswagen, all these, and they went there and they see all these people. So they become like, you know, like, uh, yeah, accidental tourists. But there is this main character, Gabriel, who is a, a passive Don Juan. He's a guy... <laughs> He's a, a guy passive he, Don Juan. Yes, that's the thing. He's a guy who doesn't do anything, but he attracts women. He doesn't know why. Yeah, that, it, this happens to us, you know. It's uh, we, we, we're like that. I know. It's, I'm, I, I'm writing from the personal experience. Yeah, and and he attracts, and then he has a, a, a wife, or I would say a, a girlfriend in in 
uh, Paris, a girlfriend in London, and a girlfriend in Frankfurt, and he has a son with the three of them, um, and also one in Barcelona, and he gives them all the same name, no? Christopher. <laughs> and this is a, one, of the, one of the mysteries of the book, and the reader has to go till the end of the novel to know why it's happened. <laughs> Now, th th this is, um, it is very funny, but it's also very, very clever as well. It's, it's like a big sort of European road movie mm -hmm, of a, mm -hmm. or road, road novel. Um, and the, the, because you've got the four brothers who are all each very interesting. You've got the four women mm -hmm. who are very interesting too. They're quite sort of, you've got the stereotypical English woman uh, yeah, who's yeah. called Sarah, Sarah who's yeah. a nurse. I think they're all a little bit... A, a nurse in a ferry, which is, yeah. it makes her a bit a a twist. Bit different, no? yeah, yeah, a bit different, yeah. But so, I mean, what, what do you... I, I mean, I hate to say it sort of sounds so important, it's self-important. What are you trying to say with, with all of this? Apart from just, you know, give everybody a good, a good read and good, have good fun. Well, you, you, you said before a, a word which is, for me, very important. It's identity. It's, uh, I try to talk about personal identity, how... Uh, Everyone tries to shape its its own identity through their own lives, and how you know this guy who is from Barcelona and who who is someone who cannot root, who doesn't like the idea of rooting. This is something that I share with the character. I I like I never feel good at one place. I always want to be in another place. I'm in London. I'm great in London, but I'm sure that tomorrow I will think, oh, I would like to be, I don't know, in Amsterdam. I Are have never been traveling? in Amsterdam. Are you always traveling? I like to travel a lot, and I like to stay in, in other places. So I guess this, this idea of not getting rooted to a place, um, it's good for the, for the main character. And then uh, after many years, his sons sort of share it. They have the same name, which is like, telling them you're not unique. But um, they, they grew up in different places, with different people, with different matters. So they get to have everyone a, a personality which is sh shaped in a different way, let's say. Now, you can read a passage for us. I will. That'd be great. Very Thank gladly. you very much. And uh, I'll read from, from the beginning of the novel. And um, you have to bear in mind that it's not me who's reading, but the four brothers that, that the tell, they tell the story all together. So it's not... It's a common, it's a common voice, and in the beginning of the novel, it's the the moment where they start uh, getting this voice together. And I'm just um, just also before you do that, I want to say that it's been um, it's been translated by Julie Walk, and it's published by Short Books, and Short Books are our first um, publisher for us too. So Jordi Ponti, reading from Lost Luggage. We have the same memory. It's very early. The sun has just come up. The three of us, father, mother, and son, are yawning sleepily. Mum's made some tea or coffee, and we dully drink it. We're in the living room, or the kitchen, as still and quiet as statues. Our eyes keep closing. Soon we hear a lorry pull up outside the house, and then the deep blast of the horn. Although we've been expecting it, we are startled by the din and suddenly wide awake. The windows rattle. The racket must have woken up the neighbors. We go out to the street to see our father off. He climbs into the truck, sticks his arm out of the window, and attempts a smile as he waves goodbye. It's clear he feels bad about leaving, or not. He's only been with us a couple of days, three at the most. His two mates call out to us from the cabin and wave goodbye to us. Time passes in slow motion. The Pegaso sets off, lumbering into the distance as if it doesn't want to leave either. Mum's in her dressing gown, and the tear rolls down her cheek, or maybe not. We, the sons, are in pyjamas and slippers. Our feet are freezing. We go inside and get into our beds, which are still slightly warm, but we can't go back to sleep because of all the thoughts buzzing around in our heads. We are three, four, five, seven years old, and we've been through the same scene several times before. We don't know it then, but we've just seen our father for the last time. We have the same memory. The scene we've just described took place about 30 years ago, and the story could begin at three different points on the map. No, no, four. The removal track might have been disappearing into the morning mist that enveloped the Quai de la Marne in the north of Paris, leaving behind a row of houses across from a canal that, in the dawn light, seemed to have been lifted from the pages of a Simenon novel. Or perhaps the truck's engine shattered the clammy silence of Martello Street next to London Fields in the East End as it headed under the railway bridge to find the main road leading out of the metropolis through the motorway where driving on the left doesn't present the same headache for a continental trucker. Or maybe it was Frankfurt, the eastern part, at one of those blocks they put up in Jacobi Strasse after the war. 
Paris, London, Frankfurt, three distant places linked by our father driving a truck that moved furniture from one side of Europe to the other. There was one more city, the fourth, which was Barcelona. Point of departure and arrival. In this case, the scene takes place without the truck and without the other two truckers. One of us, Christoffel, with his father and mother. <coughs> three people in the poorly lit kitchen on a flat in Carré del Tigre. But here too, the farewell takes place with the same calm he has counted on to the point that it almost seems rehearsed, with the same vague concern that has always worked for him before in other houses and with other families. That expression of the face, striving for composure, but brimming over with sadness which seeped into all of us. Hours later, the next day or the next week, we we'd look in the mirror while brushing our teeth and see it in our own eyes a wistfulness we all recognize. That's why we now have the feeling that our emotions were scattered far and wide, and why now, all these years later, our childhood sense of betrayal is multiplied by four. We also like to think of our mothers, the foremothers, as if they were one. Pain not shared, but multiplied. Nobody was spared. Certainly not we, for sons. What? You don't get it? It's too complicated? Well, this is going to take some explaining. We are four brothers, or more accurately, half-brothers, sons of one father and four very different mothers. Until about a year ago, we didn't know each other. We didn't even know the others existed scattered around. Our father wanted us to be called Christoph, Christoph, Christopher, and Christoffel. If you say the name out loud, Christoph, Christoph, Christopher, Christoffel, one after another, the four names sound like an irregular Latin declension. <laughs> Christoph, German nominative, was born in October 65, the impossible heir of a European lineage. Christopher, Saxon genitive, came almost two years later, his birth suddenly enlarging and adding color to the definition of a Londoner's life. The accusative, Christophe, took a little less time, 19 months, and in February 69 was the last to appear. Sorry, uh, be became the direct, in se February 69 became the direct object of a French single mother. Christophe was the last to appear, a case of circumstance completely defined by place, space, and time. Why did our father give us the same name? Why was he so single-minded about calling us that, so obstinate that in the end he managed to persuade our mothers to go along with it? Was it perhaps that he didn't want to feel we were one-offs? After all, none of us has brothers or sisters. Once we talked about it with Petroli, who, like Bundo, was a fellow tracker, and he said, no, 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 no. When he talked about us, he never got us mixed up and knew perfectly well who was who. We tell ourselves that it might be some sort of superstition. St. Christopher is the patron saint of drivers, and we, four sons, were like small offerings he left behind in each country, <laughs> candles lit to protect him as he traveled around in his track. Petroli, who knew him very well, disagrees, saying he didn't believe in any hereafter, and suggests a more fantastic but equally credible possibility. Maybe he just wanted four of a kind, a winning poker hand in sons. Four aces, he says, it, one for its suit. And what about that, we ask. He was the wild card. The joker needed to make five of a kind. Life is very short and there's no time. Christopher suddenly starts singing. We let him go on because the words are relevant. And it's a Beatles song. All of us are fans, but right now, we are not going to play at deciding who's going to be George or Paul, or Ringo or John. We are the Christophers. We'll keep this kind of exercise to ourselves. And as for this business of interrupting a conversation by breaking into a song, this is the first time and the last time we are going to let anyone chime it. Do a solo, OK, Christoph? Without the prior consent of any other three. We are not in a karaoke bar, and we need a few rules if we're going to get along. If all four brothers talk at once, it will be pandemonium. And then again, Chris is right. Life is very short, and there's no time. Wow. Thank you. Thanks so 
so much. And also thank you to the Institut Ramon Lul as well for nominating um, this wonderful book. And thank you to the Spanish Embassy as well who will be um, sponsoring the, the, the fantastic reception we've got after this too. Um, for years, we had no entries from Slovenia. Then we had eight in one go. <laughs> How could we resist? And of course, we want to do our bit to um, prop up the, um, the Slovenes and get them out of the Euro crisis, um, at least culturally. Um, I want to thank all the Slovene entries, the poetry and the reportage and the novels. They were all very, very good. In the end, we chose uh, this novel here, The German Lottery. It's a brilliant satire, morality tale and political fable. And it's told by a much published and very, very popular master storyteller. Welcome to the magnificent Miha Mazzini. We have, for a small country, again, you seem to produce a lot of writers. Is it like every second person in Slovenia is a writer? Uh, I mean, Slovenian uh, society is a very egalitarian society. <laughs> well, the thing that one can do, everybody can do. <laughs> <laughs> but I do seem to, in the last few years, met quite a few Slovene writers. Um, of course. I mean... Uh, as it's hard to find a Slovene book that's not signed, <laughs> it's hard to find a writer that hasn't write, uh, written anything yet. I think, okay. I think you, have, you have a very um, healthy book industry as well, too. Yes, yes, of course. The uh, state is fin financing uh, the publishing of the books and buying of the books for the library. So people... Uh, jump on and off, you know, like in the tall lifts, you know, <laughs> elevators, you know. yeah. But, but what about the translation? Is there also a lot of money going into translation no. as well? No. No. Uh, uh, if you're speaking yeah. about the state money. If yeah. you're speaking about my own money, yes. yes. Uh, your, your own money goes into translation. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> so there are not so many translators um, into no, English? No, they're hard to find. Mm. Now, tell us about your writing. Give people here a bit of, a, a bit of background as to, as to what, what you write. Because the very first book which made you famous, the in English, The Cartier Project, uh, yes. 1987, written under Tito, um, a very yes. different era. Yes. You were very popular then too. Um, you've obviously managed to bridge the two. I mean, uh, I, was, I was a young uh, student uh, and I was working in night shift as a night watchman. And uh, uh, when man is left alone, you know, somewhere, there was in the, I was a night watchman in the border between Yugoslavia then and Italy. And if you are left alone with nothing to do as a Slovenian, I, I wrote a novel, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think lots of Czechs did that too, and Romanians yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. You it's, know. it's a Slavic but thing. That's just yeah, why East Europeans have written yeah, so much yeah. too. But, but did, were you always writing in, in, in Slovene, did you, in, uh, in a yes, language? Yes, always. yes. Mm -hmm. And how different is it from, from Croatian, Serb Serbo-Croatian? Uh, a little bit. Uh, um, I mean, um, uh, actually, we, we grew up in the same country, so... Uh, uh, Croatian or Serbian books were cheaper, <laughs> so we learned the uh, Serbian Croatian language to, uh, uh, to to buy the books. You know, this book, the German yes. Lottery, um, was published in Slovenian um, in yes. 2010. So it's quite a, it's quite a recent novel, also in Slovenian, and it's um, now with us in English. Now, where does it fit in with your all the novels and stories and so on that you've written? Is this is this one of your favourites? Is this uh, are you happy? Happy that this one's been translated? I mean, it fits into uh, so-called my hospital novels, you know. Uh, I go for a run and then something happened to my knee or my ankle and so on, you know. And I ask, the, the first thing I ask the doctor at the hospital, how many weeks? And he says, uh, three weeks. I said, short, a short novel then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> so the, you wrote this one in, what, you were covering yes, from yes. a Yes, yes, I was preparing, I was preparing, I did a lot of research for a novel that it took me 10 years to write it. It was published last year in Slovenia. But in the middle of the research for that novel, uh, uh, something went wrong with my knee. I got three, uh, three weeks. I didn't have time to write that one, the big novel. Uh, but so that is three, you know. I mean. This is, this is uh, again, it sort of reminds me a little bit of Jakim's. It's such a brilliant idea for a novel, this one. It's called the German Lottery, and it's obviously it's a massive metaphor. Um, yes. But you, you're going back in time to you've got this this um, this again this guy in the 70s. 
he's um, looking back on his life in this Yugoslav village in the 1950s. Yes, this is something, I mean, uh, I want to have, this is called an unreliable uh, narrator, yes? Unreliable narrator, narrator yes. Absolutely. I mean, I, I remember when I was a kid reading uh, novels by, uh, written by Agatha Christie, you know, and you have this, uh, in the end, you know, this detective tells you, you know, now listen, this and this, this happened, you know, and you go, oh my God, it's true, it's true, how I didn't realize it. And even as a kid, I said to myself, okay, Micha, when you grew up, uh, grow up, you should write a novel like this, except the narrator gets it wrong. They're <laughs> totally <laughs> wrong, everything. <laughs> he gets it wrong, actually. But, but Tony, your, your, your guy, he your gets young it guy, wrong. he yeah. gets it wrong. <laughs> yes. He gets it wrong. But, but boy, do you love him, you know, because he's a naive optimist. Yes. He's, the, yes. poor Tony. I mean, Tony's, obviously you'd, you'd hurt your, your own knee, so you gave him a, yes. a, knee, <laughs> yeah. a knee disability. Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he can't walk very, well, can't walk very well. But, you know, with great communist logic, they made him into a postman. Yes. Um, yes. So, yes. so you, you obviously enjoy writing about how odd communism was. Um, the eccentricities of communism. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, the only way to survive it was by laughing at it, and you know, it's so we did actually. Um, <laughs> but then, then also this this scheme though, which is which is funny but much more serious. Yes. This the the idea of the German lottery. So you have Tony. He's going on his rounds. He meets this woman called Zora, um, who's very beautiful. He helps her rehang her washing line. Um, <laughs> It's a very <laughs> romantic story. <laughs> um, and he gets involved with her and her husband, Nikolai, the great intellectual, the great man of ideas, who comes and comes up with this scheme, the German yeah, And this scheme is, okay, it's deadly, but uh, when I told, <laughs> I tested this scheme uh, on my younger daughter, and I told her, listen, what if we... And she said, Daddy, are we rich? <laughs> I finished telling her. So uh, there was, might be a chance to activate this kind of scheme, you know? You think, you think we can do it today? No. <laughs> well, it's, but this is, it's a very serious um, idea. It's, I it's mean, a story about the greed. I always want to do something about, uh, because uh, of all the things we are, I mean, we, uh, all the feelings we have, this greed, we don't have anything... Uh, uh, we can't stop greed except with our reason, you know, and we are not very reasonable <laughs> creatures, so we are not stopping a lot of greed, you know. And uh, maybe uh, when I finished writing this novel, uh, and I, when, I, when I was finished, I wrote down the, uh, the last sentence, and then it was late in the night, and I uh, turned on, uh, uh, <clears throat> I went to the website to check the news, and the main news of the day was that some American bank called Lehman Brothers collapsed. Mm. Lehman Brothers, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Now, I mean, it, it's, it's brilliant today. It can work in any time. But the, the, the more serious point about this, which I think is terribly important to mention before you read, is that um, they devised this lottery um, to compensate um, people who had suffered under the Nazis. And so what, they, what Nikolai and Zora and the postman were going to do was to, um, to c come up with lottery tickets and the, everybody would win. Everybody who'd, been, um, who'd suffered under the Nazis. So it has a really serious message. Okay. I, mean, I know you're <laughs> laughing, but it, it's, I, I mean, I do think it's an terribly important part of the book. And it, but everybody wins. And then, of course, it becomes a very elaborate hoax and gets completely out of hand because, as you say, of greed and all the other yes. dreadful things that human beings are capable of. Yes, uh, but uh, don't uh, everybody uh, that gets the lottery ticket do doesn't, doesn't actually mm. need, need it. No, you know? that's true. Yeah, and they risk in the end they risk their lives to get it, mm. and they don't need it. It's, it's very, about greed. It's, it's about greed and and political corruption and okay. so many other really important issues in this very small mm -hmm. novel. Are you going to read a little bit for us? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, now the postman is uh, delivering first, <laughs> I mean letter. Uh, uh, there will be some rough cuts bet because I had to cut it of because of the six minutes, yes. Or less. Or less. Yes. And because I wanted to leave out the juicy parts for the readers. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't give too much away. <laughs> uh, she was hanging the washing when I came limping around the corner. 
she was scantily dressed again. <laughs> Perhaps the dress was handed down to her or she got it from United Nation aid package because it only reached to her knees. That day was cool and windy, her legs were bare, and she was standing on a footstool to reach the line strung across the terrace. I said hello by the book and asked for proof of identity. She gave me a surprised look, as if to say, am I not the same as yesterday? I explained that rules are there to be obeyed. <laughs> All right, she said, and stepped down from the footstool. But she must have leaned on the line too much while doing it because it came undone and she only just managed to grab it. Help, hold it. I took the line, but most of the washing already folded along the ground. Pull it up, pull it up. I lifted my arms high up and the washing started flapping again. She brought her hands before her mouth. Oh, thank you. You spared me from doing the washing again in that icy creek. My arms started to shake. Comrade, please, could you fasten the line? <laughs> of course, of course. She grabbed the free end and wanted to pull it to the hook around which it had been fastened before. Come closer. I took a few steps, so I stood right next to her. She quickly made a nod, but couldn't reach to put it over the hook. Closer, closer. I was pushing closer and closer to her, but it didn't help. She quickly went to get the footstool. Now we were face to face. My arms started jerking and going numb from the strain. She stopped right before my face as if she had just noticed something. How strong you are, she whispered. <laughs> and I felt her breath on my skin. It smelled of coffee, real coffee, not chicory. And then there was that strange heady scent, perfume, which made me dizzy, so I started to breathe heavily. We kept pressing and pressing against each other, but we still couldn't reach the hook. My legs became shaky, the back was still quite heavy, my knees started playing up, sweat began trickling down my back. I felt it between my shoulder blades. She placed her arms around my neck, turned me around, and tried to fasten the line to the hook leaning over me. She wasn't very good at it, but it wasn't the right moment to point that out. <laughs> S some women just aren't cut out for something, but they are offended if you mention it. <laughs> In her effort, she leaned on me with all her weight, and I really couldn't bear it anymore. I yielded, she screamed, and the washing switched down again. I quickly got up and held it up. The back, come on, let me take your back. She tried to pick it up by the strap, but she couldn't, so she got up on the footstool again on tiptoe, and then she tried to lift the strap slowly over my head. She was also sweating under her armpits. I saw a drop trickle into her cleavage, and the tips of her bra were rubbing through that flimsy dress against the heavy cloth of my uniform. She lifted the strap as much as she could. I had to bow my head and found myself in a cleavage. What a wonderful scent! I kept outing in my mouth, gasping. She moved away. The cold air did me good. She stood before me with the back, which was too heavy for her, dragging it along the ground. Comrade, be careful with that back! <laughs> Yes, of course. She put it on the table and got back on the footstool. Again, she leaned over me. Again, I breathed heavily from the perfume. And then, I'm embarrassed to say, I had to remind myself I was a state official on duty. <laughs> <laughs> I was filled with strange emotions. Not that, I ever, that, that I've never had those kinds of feelings before, but this time they were so strong and powerful, I was becoming afraid of myself. My eyes were doubting, darting, flitting, searching for anything to turn to while my body was trapped in her domain. I tried thinking about the back, wondering if it was safe. I watched it on the table. Was it just as full as before? Did somebody pinch a letter from it? A lost letter, a postman's greatest nightmare. That was all I thought about and about the code of practice. I kept saying it silently like a prayer, like Hail Mary's and Lord's prayers, saying she was a customer and I official delivering registered mail. The procedure might have got a little out of hand, but everything would soon be back to normal. I just had to hold out. It felt like eternity. She was trying, but clumsy as she was, it took her forever until she finally managed to slip the line on the hook and rescue the washing. We were facing each other completely soaked. Thank you. I know that comrade, a postman is always ready to help. That's nice to hear. I straightened my uniform and put the back over my shoulder. Do you come around in the evenings too? No, I deliver only in the mornings. But if you drop off the mail in mailbox by 7 p.m., it's collected the same day, except on Saturdays when you have to drop it by 1 p.m. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you so much. That was the German lottery. It was read by Miha Mazzini. I want to say also it was translated by Urshka Zupanec and it was published by CB Editions and nominated by Bellatrina Academic Press and all for the first time here at the European Literature Night. So it's fantastic. Um, earlier this year, when the snow lay thick, and even on the ground. I was artistic director of a week-long literature roadshow through England called High Impact. We travelled to six cities with six top writers from the Low Countries, from Belgium and the Netherlands. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce you to two writers from the Low Countries who were not free to participate then, but were selected by the judges uh, for ELN because they are just that, High Impact. First, from Belgium, welcome to Elvin Mortier. Now, for a very long time, I've been a fan of um, Erwin's writing, his novels, and several have been published already in English by Harvel originally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in German. And I've read um, um, Goethe Schlaf in, in German as well. But now Pushkin Press has taken on the task of republishing all the titles all in English, them. which is fantastic. And two uh, future ones as well, it's so seven in all. Future, right, they've, they've locked you in. Yeah, for life. <laughs> they've committed. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's brilliant. Now, they're starting off, though, with Marcel, which yeah. was your... My debut. Your uh, debut, your first 14 novel. 14 years ago. Yeah. Amazing. Now, again, you know, one of the other writers also was looking back at his first novel um, from a long time ago. How do you feel when you look back at Marcel now, sort of almost 15 years after it was first published. Do you still like it? Uh, I took it out of my uh, library two weeks ago, and when I read it, I thought, well, that guy can write, you know. <laughs> you, you did like it? Yeah, I did yeah? like it. I still like it. Wasn't, it wasn't in any way embarrassing to think, oh, I'll rewrite that oh, sentence? Oh, no, it's, it's the book that almost overnight changed my life. Uh, it was published and... and uh, the Belgian and the Dutch press almost exploded with joy and um, so it came out I remember the, the, the uh, 25th February of 1999 and, and before that date I was a rather dusty uh, scientific assistant in a Ghent museum and then That's right, you, were, you worked in a, in a museum of psychiatry the, Yes, for the history of psychiatry <laughs> It's all interesting fodder for books, you know. Yes. And you studied art history too, didn't <laughs> and you? And archaeology, yes. So, so that so it transform. I mean, I actually look back at some of the original reviews too from this book from this long ago. It's all true, and people were amazed. Where has this guy come from? Um, it must have been a fantastic opening for you, launch for you. Yes, it took it took a while to get adjusted to it, you know, because for the first two weeks, I remember we were having my husband and I were having sometimes having breakfast, and there was a photographer waiting, looking at me and thinking, "Finish your cereals, dear. We have to work." <laughs> uh, and uh, I gave interviews for two weeks, and um, suddenly, I was a, a public figure. And, but how, how many books have you written since then? I know there's a kind of um, trilogy. I'm now writing my seventh novel, and I've also written two, three collections of poetry and uh, essays and some theatrical text as well. You're quite a serious writer. Of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like about it. I mean, basically, it's very, very difficult when you know a writer and you know, with, with you, I do know your writing, and we're just lucky not to have just had one published in English. Um, and to be able to sum up with somebody sitting here um, and, and, and to try to tell you, to convey to you how beautiful this writing is and the stories and and I know that you have certain themes that you always go back to you um, you're very visual you write a lot about mm -hmm. photography mm -hmm. um, shutter speed was the second novel I think that's the third, the third, one, third yes. novel and you wrote about photography and filmmaking in that so it's very important for you how people see things the wars you, you mm -hmm. write about the first world war the second yeah. world war also translated i've uh, just published uh, last week the, my translation of the last novel of virginia wolf and i've also translated three other uh, writings by war nurses mm -hmm. so i'm hoping your majesty is going to obe me soon <laughs> <laughs> Are we allowed to do that? <laughs> give her a hint, yes. you know? <laughs> but how, 
I mean, how do how do you do it all basically? Because you write, you must be writing all the time. You translate, as you say, and you're writing poetry mm -hmm. and novels. I, c I remember writing since I was eleven. You know, um, so and uh, when my my debut came out, it was a post. Apart from meeting my my beloved my beloved husband, it's it's been the greatest joy of my life, mm -hmm. and writing still is a, a source of uh, profound happiness uh, to me. Um, I don't like writers who say they have a career; they should be shot at dawn, mm -hmm. and uh, because <laughs> it is a, a if you discover you have a talent, it it is a, a privilege. And um, it is also uh, a kind of vocation. You have to be true to it and to develop it. And mm -hmm. that's for me a source of, of immense joy. Well, <laughs> oh, bravo. <laughs> let's, let's go back in time and look at Marcel yeah. and, and tell people a little bit about this, this novel. Do you want to give the synopsis or shall I or however? Oh, please do. You, I know that normally people, <laughs> they don't like to do it. Um, <laughs> But um, as you say, this is your first novel, and mm -hmm. I'll just I'll just read it very a very quick synopsis, mm -hmm. and then you can do the the interesting Filling stuff in. and talk about yeah. what it all means. Okay. Um, <laughs> you've got a ten year old boy, mm -hmm. and he lives with his grandparents in a Flemish village. Um, his grandmother um, guards the family dead. Um, these are basically photographs um, in the cabinet. With fierce determination, she keeps arranging and rearranging these photographs. She's probably the most important character in many ways. Um, and they are marked in this cabinet by their proximity to a statue of the Virgin Mary. Um, but there's one photograph, one image next to the Virgin Mary, and this is of a boy called Marcel who died um, far too young and for whom there's no grave. And so the story is about how he died. Yeah, and also I think about having to live with painful truths and with shame and with historical trauma and how um, when you, like in my case, I, it's quite autobiographical in the sense that one of my great uncles died as, as a German soldier or a Flemish soldier in the German army in Russia. And it's about um, how to live with that shame and to live with secrecy and silence and half spoken truths and that was the interesting thing for me as a writer to recreate the, the, the atmosphere I had felt as a young child you know it's not maybe not the task of, of literature to give answers but to make audible and tangible the complexity of what it is to be a human being and to have to make choices that can be very terrible. Because this young boy discovers by taking this photograph um, to his school, yep. um, his teacher, who he adores, mm -hmm. um, tells him that one of the little images on, on this photograph is a swastika. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the boy thinks it's an eagle carrying a, a clock, you know. Yes. Mm. But uh, Mrs. Fehat, as the teacher is called, says that it's not a a clock with a swastika, and the little boy doesn't understand. He, he thinks a swastika is a, is a kind of animal he doesn't know yet. And that in a kind reflects the way a lot of stories or silences just pours into me as a child. Mm -hmm. And um, in a sense, uh, being immersed in a history I couldn't understand yet at the time. And you give such a vivid portrait of, <laughs> of, of rural uh, Flanders, Belgium yep. at the time as well, and of course, you know, the, the repercussions of post-war in, in, that, in that particular yep. part of the world as yep. well. Yep. Now we're going to hear a reading um, from this um, wonderful book, and it's going to be read by um, Shamila Besmoon. Thank you, Shamila. And I'm just going to tell you very quickly, it's uh, published by, will be published soon by uh, Pushkin Press, and it's been translated by Ina Rilke. Um, and just to add, um, it's available for pre-order on the Speaking Volumes website. This um, um, is from the very start of the novel. The house looked like all the others on the road, sagging slightly after two centuries of habitation, driving winds and war. Behind the hedge, a spine of roof tiles slumped between two gables. 
The windows sat a little tipsily in the walls. Wooden clogs potted with petunias hung by the door. Most of the rooms harboured a limbo of darkness, cool in summer, chilly in winter. In some, the walls had absorbed the smell of generations of cooked dinners, as in the kitchen, where grease clung to the rafters. The cellar stored, the attic forgot. By the end of August, the cold began to rise from the floors. At night, there was a smell of frost in the air. Sometimes, before a downpour, the clouds skimmed so low over the roof that they seemed to be torn asunder from, by the finial. The light grew thin. The grass in the orchard sparkled until well after midday. The garden shrugged off its last lingering touches of colour and assumed the same grey shade as the gravestones in the church, churchyard nearby. I was taken there once a year by the grandmother, but she herself was a daily visitor. It was less than five turnings between the garden gate and the place where her dead lay sleeping. She did not hold with buying flowers for All Souls Day. There were always daisies pushing up from the graves. They would do well enough, she thought. Tombstone plaques decorated with porcelain roses filled her with scorn. She had epitaphs of her own carved in the granite of her soul. She was the unbending midwife of her tribe. She would not allow her dead to vanish unattended. Once they were buried, their bodies became earth. She raked partings in their hair and clipped the bushes by their headstones as if they were fingernails. Wedding rings had been transferred from the cold fingers of the dead to those of the warm-blooded living. She had folded their spectacles and laid them in a drawer where they joined the tangle of all the other pairs with their long grasshopper legs. After each funeral, she would open the curtains in the back room, raise the roller blind and put fresh sheets on the bed. The time will come for each and every one of us, she would say, turning back the covers. Into bed with you, no dawdling now. The chapel of rest had become a guest room again. The alarm clock on the bedside table ground the seconds away. The fluorescent green face glowed spectrally in the dark. I hardly dared move between the sheets for fear of rousing the lost souls in the bed springs, which jangled accusingly at the slightest movement of my limbs. The house was a temporary annex to heaven due to a shortage of space. Within the confines of the glass-fronted cabinet, the dead faded less rapidly than the living, whose austerely framed portraits hung unprotected on the walls of the parlour. They were not swathed in garlands of gilt or s ribbons of silver, nor were they as conscientiously cherished. All, sale, All Souls Day came four times a month at the grandmother's house. First she whisked her duster over the statue of the Virgin Mary and the miniature Zer, at Zer Tower comm commemorating the Flemish so soldiers killed in the Great War. Then she instructed me to hand her the photographs, one by one, not randomly, but in the order in which they had left their realm. They piled up. A young generation had arisen. The old one was gently falling away. In the end, there were more photographs than I could hold. I laid them on the table in the proper sequence and patiently slid them over one at a time to be put back in the cabinet. In their ornate frames, they looked like fragile carriages lining up to go through customs. The grandmother blessed them with her duster and told me all their names. Clutches of aunts, nephews, distant cousins, nieces came up for review. Most of them were unknown to me, aside from a picture and a terminal disease. Four times a month, I would listen to her reel off the same causes of death, pausing now and then to, to give a little sniff of resignation. Bertrand was one of the few I had actually met, my first dead body. Someone had to be the first, and I could have done worse. One sunny Friday afternoon, I came upon him quite rigid, hunched over the table in the low-ceilinged back kitchen of his tumble-down home. His hand was reaching for his inhaler. Asthma, the grandmother declared. His lungs wheezed out so loud you could hear it in the street. His daughter could barely wait to flog his antiques, tear the old house down and build a, build a villa with a swimming pool. The grandmother took a dim view of this. She never even lifted a finger for him. A hint of malice entered her voice, for, her, for the daughter's gleeful anticipation of her riches had been short-lived. Popped her clogs before the week was out. A burst appendix, it seems, after eating a boiled egg with a piece of eggshell on it. She was bent double with pain. Too mean to call a doctor, though. <laughs> Bertrand's daughter was relegated to the darkest corner of the shelf. 
No one was given any old place in the cramped afterlife of the cabinet, which was shared with the wine glasses and a coffee service. There was hell, paradise, and purgatory. Aside from a few blessed souls who had special claims to proximity to the Virgin, no one could count on a fixed ranking. <laughs> Posthumous promotion could happen, but being taken down a peg or two was more likely. One day, Bertrand found, too found himself in purgatory, second row, behind the Virgin's back. News had reached the grandmother of some sin he had committed. It seems he beat his wife. When I asked her why, she went quiet. Indeed, lad, she sighed at last. Why would anyone do such a thing? She was given to remarks like that. Well, my dear Morris, they won't be back, that's for sure, she would sigh. Morris ran a draper's shop in town, which she visited every few weeks. She always phoned first, saying, Morris, I need some merchandise. I'm coming to see you. He would be waiting in the doorway for her to arrive. A short man, bald but for a few tufts around the ears, with a lumpy red nose over a pencil moustache. The shop window bore the name Bernard's Textiles, elegantly scripted in white paint. Getting himself worked up for one of his Italian welcomes, no doubt, the grandmother would hiss between her teeth as we rounded the corner. She was seldom mistaken. As soon as he spotted us, Morris rushed forward, flapping his arms and rubbing his hands together. He seized the grandmother's shoulders and kissed her loudly three times. Whenever Andrea calls, he rejoiced, it makes my day. That will do, Morris. She glanced round to make sure there weren't too many people watching. I'm not the queen, you know. <laughs> Shamila and Irwin and um, sorry we are running a little bit over but we did start late as well and I'm really sorry about that but if you are um, you must stay around because we've got two amazing writers still to go um, and before a bit, very very briefly before um, I bring on the second high impact writer I want to say um, how much I've been looking forward to talking to him um, particularly interviewing particularly because <coughs> finally I've got somebody I can talk to about fashion um, because I've heard that um, He's actually a shoe fanatic. Um, welcome to Frank Westerman from the Netherlands. <laughs> not very, not very exciting shoes tonight. But um, no, somebody, somebody told me about this. Is it true? I thought that question came because you are a shoe no, fanatic. No, I, I was hoping. I, I've worn them for you, basically. I was hoping that you. But would... some questions tell more about yourself. Ah. As they... <laughs> Go on, ask, ask me anything then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what about a colour red? Ah, no, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah. It's definitely my favourite colour. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, you, you, but it is true, isn't it? Um, you love shoes and you love fashion and, and so on too. It's, it's kind of nice for, for me to find somebody who does <laughs> amongst writers. Well, let's not, say yes. Not many writers do. Um, but just so that people don't think I'm trivialising um, what you do, this is a really, really great writer, a great journalist, correspondent and has been all over the world and you have written five six books yeah yeah i'm working on number you, eight you're working on number eight so in that case seven books um and but five of them have been translated into english or six well three three i've got, I've got quite a long <laughs> list here <laughs> um i do love sailing boats you do you love sailing boats no i know i'm just <laughs> kidding <laughs> So how would you describe, I mean, basically, it's non-fiction, it's, it's, it's contemporary history, it's, it's journalism. Sorry to stop you at this, but it, it's not an act, but, uh, and it's not, to, please do not take this personally, I don't like the label non-fiction. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you do. Well, um, they're stories, mm -hmm. but they're true. Um, it's like you have the genre of crime, crime stories, and then you also have true crime. That's even more. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say better, but it's... If you call it non-fiction, I don't want to be labelled by what I'm doing not. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, you've, you've travelled... You've travel, as, a, as a journalist, yeah. you travelled an awful lot, which yeah. means... And you experienced an awful lot. You were in Yugoslavia and Srebrenica and so on too. Yeah. I mean, you experienced a lot, which, even though I imagine it was very difficult, it was good material. 
as journalists will often say. Is that, how, is, is that how you see, I mean, did your travels, you know, did you travel in order to write or did you, did you write after you travel? How did it, how did that come about? Oi. Um, well, I, 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 when I travel, I, I do travel, um, but not extra, not, not a lot, I think. I, I, I go to places uh, and I register or I try to participate a bit, so I, I, I do observe what, what happens. But uh, the real traveling uh, occurs, I think, when you write, uh, even uh, through stories. Mm. Uh, because you, 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 you swallow it again, your experiences, but you have to give words to it. And uh, the only tool you have is the language. So, so how do you represent what you have seen or experienced? Um, that's... Um, uh, well, you have only a limited uh, uh, amount of tools, like your imagination, uh, which is not switched off if you do non-fiction. Um, uh, it's uh, timing, it's style, it's the sound of the vowels. The, the, the. So that's, that's, that's an all different experience. I think that's the real traveling. I mean, the, the, the going to places is one thing, but then trying to write about is, is, is quite another. Mm. So what yeah. is the origin of Brother Mendel's perfect horse? The is origin, that, yeah. Right, I mean, this is, this is, you could interpret it as a book about Lipizzana horses. You could interpret yeah. it as a history of Europe. You could interpret it yeah. as your story yeah. um, through looking at um, <coughs> different you know, breeding programs. Yeah. Or, I mean, what, what for you was the starting point of this book? Um, well, they're beautiful horses. The, I, like, I, I love these uh, horses, and I used to ride as a, as a child. Uh, Till I was 16, 17, uh, almost every day. Um, but that's, well, yeah, that's important, but that's not the, the, the real starting point of the book. Um, actually, um, I think that um, a few things came together. Uh, well, the Lipizzaners, they are famous from, they call it dancing, classical music, Spanish writing school, the Habsburg Empire. Uh, they're still there. They're still living. They're living in the in the in the Hofburg in Vienna. That's all the, the the folklore, the fairy tale. It's it's real, but it's 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 a, it's also a story. Um, and then I I, I thought like, um, what if I um, I write a, a family chronicle, basically of the horse that I had known as a child. That was the um, the prize mm -hmm. horse stallion of the stables, the riding school uh, where I was riding. Um, and write um, a family chronicle of the 20th century of Europe by just following the fate of four generations of stallions that were famous, that were at the eye of the hurricanes of mm. the wars. And, um, I, try, uh, I try to follow that, 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 that line. But they're not subjects, they're objects. Mm. I don't make them speak or yeah. comment on history, but... It's a bit like this, the first question, this, this, this beginning of our talk, that I, uh, that we, well, we were trying to say, well, trying to find common ground or whatever. Um, what we do and see in Lipitaner horses tells uh, pretty much about who we are. What we see in it is it racial purity. It's a bastard. It's, it, it was created from scratch, from from different breeds of horses 400 years ago, a horse that had to carry the emperor, um, but it started off as a bastard, and we call it a racial pure horse. So this tells more about us than about a poor Lipizzaner. Mm. And this is what I try to do every, everywhere. Uh, 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 these horses are, in a way, um, the prism through which I try to look at, uh, or the mirror, uh, mm. to look at ourselves. The, the, there are some, I mean, it is, I'm not interested in horses at no, all. No, me neither. <laughs> but you, you ride yeah. them. At least, no, I like them, yeah. You like them. I mean, th th that's what's so amazing for me yeah. about this book. And again, um, I th we all felt the same way about it. The, the fact that this is a book about horses, but it's, it's, like, it's written like a page-turning novel. Um, because it's a history story. I mean, I kept reading out passages to my husband saying, did you know that, <laughs> that, 
you know, there were six, only six breeds or six pure yeah. lines of, yeah. of Libitsana. It is an amazing story. And, but what, what you tell also about the, 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 the Nazi breeding programs and right. things, I mean, these, these are really extraordinary. So I didn't know any of that. I didn't know that Auschwitz yeah. had a stud farm. Yeah. For, I mean, amazing stories. You did a lot of research for this. You traveled a lot. Yeah, I did. But uh, it's also the way how you look at it. Because I have I've one, one example of this uh, Nazi scheme of creating, enhancing people, creating a better breed of superhumans. Um, this is a Nazi uh, textbook, school book, Nazi 30, uh, the 30s, uh, biology for school children. And it has this, uh, this thing in the background. It's called... Uh, Anantafel. Here you have to put your name and your parents, grandparents, but also the color of your hair, weiß blonde, hell blonde, halb blonde, bunter blonde, the color of your skin, etc. And it was actually copied from <laughs> from what a Lipizzaner horse uh, has. It's the pedigree. The pedigree. A pedigree. Horse. It's the. Uh, so it's the same. Travels like um, an ancestor, a table of yeah. ancestry. And it's the same. Uh, the same format. And so the horse's name and the, the parents of, of the horse, the great grandparents, the great grandparents. This is the, the, the pedigree is the, is the main document for a purebred horse to have. Uh, and it's, I think there are many similarities. Now there is a documentary maker who wants to, to, to make a documentary about, and he comes back to me and asks me, but where in the history books I see the connection between Nazi Germany and the Lipizzaner horses? I cannot find it beyond your book. Well, yeah, I mean, I point at these, these kind of similarities. I, I, I don't make them up, but, but, but I try to highlight them. They're not uh, um, necessarily in other textbooks or in other history books. Uh, it's, I, I was looking for these kind of um, stories that, that, that are true, but at the same time, probably not imagined before. Well, it's a, I mean, I must say, it's a great contribution to history. This, it, it's really, I mean, eye-opening, gobsmacking <laughs> stuff. You're going to read a passage for us from this book. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Brother Mendel, um, again, it's one of these sort of almost like a crossword um, clue, isn't it? Who is Brother Mendel? But um, I'm sure you all know. Brother Mendel was... Um, he, it's he called was the father of genetics. The father of genetics, researched peas. Uh, 12,835 crossing experiments, and then he had a clue. There you are. This is something light. Just um, an encounter with a, a man who, is, who becomes a character in the book, or character, a real person. At the center of the ring that was the world of Lipizzaners, stood a Viennese hippologist named Hans Brabenetz. He knew their individual paces, their characters. He did not own a computer. The bloodlines of 5,000 horses were stored in his brain. Herr, Bra Herr Brabenetz could be found in the Vienna phone directory listed as certified horse breeding professional. Pacing back and forth before the windows of my office, I practiced three German sentences. Then I punched in the number and explained to Brabenetz, the R dark and rolling, who I was and why I hoped to speak to him. I also told him that I would be coming to Vienna that weekend to visit the Spanish riding school. Hofreitschule, he said, the Royal Spanish Riding School. Hofreitschule, I corrected myself. Herr Hartmann, before you go any further, do you mind my asking your age? I did it between repeating my correct name or stating my age. 42, I said at last. Ha ha, I'm twice as old as you, I'm 84. After congratulating him on his seniority, I started talking about the Lipizzaners. What intrigued me most was the idea of their nobility, a human-bred animal that resided on the top rung of racial enhancement. If anybody could tell me about the background of this imperial horse, he could. At his age, Brabene said, the world around him no longer proceeded as, at such a clip. If I would go to the trouble of writing a letter, he would reply within two weeks. But before that, may I ask what it is that you want from me? I started by describing 
Conversano Primula, that's the, the famous horse from my youth, and his ancestors, who Pete had told me included famous stallions that had performed in Vienna. He listened for a minute, then asked, have you ever been a soldier? I had to admit I hadn't. Then it's going to be difficult. If you've never served in the army, how can I explain these things to you? I've been in wars, I said, in the Balkans and the Caucasus. Ah, ich auch, I heard him say, also in the Balkans, and almost in the Caucasus. We landed in the Crimea, 42, but we never, never got any further than Kerch Peninsula. He paused, then asked, Gavarici Paruski? I replied in Russian. Brabenets growled. I used to speak it. You see, I spent two and a half years as a Soviet prisoner of war. We learned Armee Russis. But you know what? If you call me on Sunday, once you get to Vienna, I'll let you know whether you c I can receive you on Monday. Just one bit. I met him, and he invited me on a trip to uh, the stud farm Lipica. It's on the border between Slovenia and Italia today, where 400 years it was the birthplace of the Lipizzaner breed. And uh, we were together with uh, friends of the Spanish riding school, Freunde der Spanische Hofreitschule, old Austrians. I mean, the people that I was with still think that um, the emperor is still there in Vienna. <laughs> and we came to see young stallions there out in the fields. The red tractor had almost disappeared when someone shouted, here they come. At first, I couldn't see anything. The hilly landscape was grayish green with gray spots, the sky above a light blue. Somewhere on the horizon, am am amid this pallet, a dark serpent was twining along, 70 young stallions coming down to the slope at a gallop. I saw a swell of horses' bodies moving forward in waves and heaves. Sometimes the ribbon disappeared into a fold in the landscape and was lost from sight for 30 seconds or more. One never knew when the stallions would reappear, but when they did, they were suddenly much closer. Soon, you could make out the individual animal and feel the earth tremble. tremble. I stepped to one side, from where we had gathered in the corral, directly in front of the open barn doors. The others remained where they were. I divided my attention between the unrushing herd with their flattened ears and, their joyous face, and the joyous faces of Frau Brabenetz and Frau Bachinger, who stood watching arm in arm. The horses shot through the funnel-shaped fences of the corral without slowing. In the final straight, they accelerated to a sprint, but where was the finish line? Never before I had witnessed so many horses racing towards me simultaneously. Their hoofs flung sand and pebbles from the ground. The noise they made was not a ruffle, not a stamping, but a wall of sound. The ladies from Vienna apparently had no intention of moving aside. I had flattened myself against the white wooden fence. Just as I was about to scramble over it, I heard a wild whinnying. Looking up, I saw the animals come scree screeching to a halt, as though on command, amid a cloud of dust, at an arm length, arm's length from Frau Wachinger and Frau Brabenetz. Their handbags still slung over one shoulder, the ladies promptly began patting the greys like blue ribbon winners. The corral had been transformed into a chaos of humans and animals, but what did it matter? Stallions that nibbled at shawls and hairdos were barely reprima reprimanded. Hans Brabenetz stood in the midst of it all, his chin held high. Bravo, a lady said, in a head shouted to the horses, like an opera lover shearing her favorite tenor. writing and a dream translation by Sam Garrett too, whose um, uh, work we had quite a lot of um, on the High Impact Tour. It's been published, um, Brother Mendel's Perfect Horse has been published by Harville Secker and as you hear, written by <laughs> Frank Westman. Um, now, Frank and um, my next guest probably have a little bit in common because um, you've been to Armenia, you've written about Mount Ararat, I think, as well, too. And our final guest is, um, is a journalist, and she's um, a remarkable woman who I met last year at the Hay Festival. I was completely bowled over by her. She's from Turkey, 
and uh, she's written widely on Turkey and Armenia and on many, many other issues. She's won the Pen for Peace Award and Turkish Journalist of the Year. She's brave and she's brilliant. Ece Temelkaran. They should establish a new category in con film festival, like chair door or something well, for you. <laughs> we, we could talk about fashion too. You've got a very nice dress on. Thank I you must very say. much. It's lovely. Um, and new haircut since I last saw you at Hay. But um, <laughs> now we're we going to talk. <laughs> definitely, definitely not. Um, just to say, I can do it with women as well. But um, Eche, it is great to see you again. And I just you want too. to. I, I want to talk very, very quick. Get this out in the open. Turkey at European Literature Night. Mm -hmm. Good, bad. How do you feel? I feel European as much as a Beiruti, Beiruti who does contemporary art, or uh, Egyptian who is on Tahrir Square, or um, a student, university student who is in a demonstration and who is being pepper gas, let's say. I think the Europe, the concept of Europe should be redefined. And I think we need a new concept, something like Andalusia Reloaded, uh, because <laughs> Yeah, mm. because the, the experiences in those squares, like Tahrir, Caspa, Madrid, Athens, and so on, I think they should be all combined, and we should come to a new definition of Europe. Because all those people, somehow, by soul, or by, I don't know, by <laughs> wish may, their wishful thinking, maybe, they want to live like a European, in a way. Not completely, in a way. And the fact that um, that you know we've included Turkey in European Literature Night—that's perfectly normal and something that you would not question for a moment. Come again? I'm sorry. And um, the I, fact uh, that we've included Turkey in European Literature Night—I mm. mean, for me, yeah. absolutely no problem at all. Um, I wonder whether anybody else thinks it's an issue, but um, some people do yeah. question why well, have we included yeah, Turkey? My okay, in our elementary schools. Uh, did I tell you this before? Because this is a tell story that I you tell told them. all the time. <laughs> because it tells uh, a lot, I think. In our elementary schools, there were these maps which showed uh, Turkey as the biggest country in the, con in the world. And on the left upper side, it was Europe, a little bit, very lively, very detailed, you know, all colorful and everything. And on the, you know, this side, uh, down, it's like a desert, like Iraq, Iran, and no cities, you know, dirty Arabs and desert and camels. So it was like, you know, the establishment uh, was telling you to go there, like, you know, to Europe. Uh, whereas, I'm like, this, this part of the, country, uh, the world is not for you. So now it's a bit changing with the new government and everything, and now we're having these new maps with more detailed Middle East, less uh, Europe, and so on and so forth. So Turkey is changing. And well, actually, I wouldn't consider myself European. I would consider myself Middle Eastern. And that would, again, you know, make most of the people angry in Turkey as well, because they're like quite confused. They want to be European. They want to, they want to keep their roots with the Middle East. They want to, you know, be healthy in the schizophrenic situation in a way. Are these still good questions to ask, or are you a bit tired of these questions now? I'm, I'm very, very tired. That's very why tired. I'm let's doing move, this memorise. Let's move thing. on. <laughs> I'm very good at it, though. I'm like, you know, talking politics is so, so easy. But you know what, what's interesting for me is, since, since we also last met, and you're particularly well known for your, for your journalism, Mm. And lately, and novels commentary. are novels are more, you know, becoming more famous than my journalism. But that's what I wanted to ask you: is wh is why you've made, you know, after twenty years, being better known for your for your mm. your politics and so on, and quite controversially because you've written about um, the Armenian diaspora and the Kurds and about women's issues. You put yourself at risk. You've yep. you've had um, a, a difficult life. It's not been mm. easy, yep. and now you've turned with great love. To literature, does that um, mean you've does, have you left the left the journalism behind? Two reasons, I think. Firstly, I come from literature anyway. My first books were poem and prose, which I think opera of literature. And the second reason, I think fiction is more uh, influential, has more impact on people. My journalism, unfortunately, couldn't change anything in my country, but. I have a bread tree in Beirut. I, I really love to tell about this little story. 
You have uh, a bread tree. Yeah. In my previ previous novel, Sounds of Bananas, uh, it, it takes place partly in Beirut. And I created this character called Zainab Hanem. And she's a former leftist. She wants to help the poor people, but she hates them. She is disgusted by poor. So she f comes up with this idea. She puts uh, leftover breads in a, in a bag, and she hangs them on the tree. And the whole neighborhood who wants to help the poor, but they are disgusted by the poor, they follow the idea. And th there are bread trees in the certain street of Zainab Hanum. So everybody, most of the people who read the book, they wanted to go to Beirut. And you know, with book in their hands, they start looking for this bread tree. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was okay until at some point. And then I went to Beirut and I, you know, met some people who started thinking that there is a bread tree in Beirut that only they don't know. Mm. So I think I created this Beirut bread tree, which everybody, not some of the people in Beirut, even in Beirut, think that there it still it exists, but they didn't see them. So my journalism is so weak comparing to this example. Seriously. It's, fa it's fascinating because I mean you're in a, in a way you're dismissing you know so much of what you've done which is which was very important journalism I, I, mm. I feel sad in a way that you feel that you didn't have an impact I mean I think the literature is wonderful and the reason we, we talk less about it is because so little has been translated yep we have one we have some extracts from sounds of bananas and I need yeah. to read from that as well that would make a huge bit of difference I think, if, if we had inshallah more, as inshallah, we say in Turkish. if there are publishers out there <laughs> this is a wonderful writer and please publish these books these novels in English because well there are you know good publishers who are interested but we couldn't decide yet <laughs> this is what my yeah. agent told I'm, me. I'm, to I'm taking 10%. <laughs> no, um, well, I'm like, I'm writing that in about that part of the world. And that part of the world, if you're coming from that part of the world, you know, under the belly, let's say, <laughs> um, you're expected to, you know, tell about certain things in a certain way. So issues yeah. and problems. And you, ha you are expected to talk about your country's problems uh, with a woman's eye and stuff. And, and I'm not talking, talking about my country when I am doing literature. I'm talking about Arab countries mostly. Uh, Sons of Bananas, I wrote in Beirut. I lived there for a year. Uh, the last book, uh, Women Who Blow on Nuts, I wrote it in Tunis. Uh, and I lived there for a while. So uh, my, my, the main idea is to talk about these people, not as Arabs, not, you know, not to feed that you know, pornographic curios curiosity of the Western audience. Because uh, overall, all in all, we as writers of the world, I think, we are working for this industry where the main target is the American housewives. <laughs> no, seriously. Because uh, the, the, the best seller selling lists are made according to supermarket sales. And supermarket sales are for American housewives. So we are entitled to reduce our stories, very complicated stories, to for American housewives who don't know where our countries are. <laughs> so I, um, if there is an American housewife in this audience, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm leaving her aside. So, um, yeah, and this reducing the story um, is the main issue of literature when you're coming from, uh, not from London, let's say, not from Western society. And I think literature is a better way to deal with this expectation mm. than journalism. Mm. Because when you're a journalist, you're expected to be the you know, this internationally suffering uh, third world uh, person. Because you have to talk about this, you know, how you're oppressed, how you're censored, how you are dealing with dangers and so on. And you but, have talked about all those things too. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately I journalist. did because I was yeah, in danger. Yeah. But now I am really, you know, bored of that. And when I am trying to do this literature without, the redu without reducing the stories of the people who are living underbelly of the world. I'm really happy to focus on your literature. And, and, and from the extracts I've read of Sounds of Bananas, which is about, as you say, about Beirut, it's about sounds of this amazing city. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a love story. 
Mm. There are two and a half love stories. Two and a half. Yeah. You fit in as many as you can. <laughs> You're going to read an extract for us. Yeah, yeah this is a letter from Shatila camp just before the Sabra Shatila massacre. And Dr. Hamza writes this letter to her, his daughter. And she calls her Kibbe. Kibbe is a little meatball. And the, she, he thinks, Dr. Hamza thinks that Filipina, her, his daughter, looks like a Kibbe when she's a baby. July 15, 1982, Shatila camp. Filipina, my sweet kibbe. We fall in love with a person when we see in them a doorway to another life. It is neither happiness nor pain that draws us to them. What we call love is this, a person sees in another an unearthly house. I saw in your mother just such, such a doorway, just such a house. My name is Hamza. In Shatila camp, I'm known as Dr. Hamza, but don't let me, my name fool you. I was always a small man, a shriveled up breastbone. As for your mother, she looked like she was tossed from her mother's body before she had a chance to grow. It seems people love those who, whose wounds fit into their own. The commandos who brought your mother here had asked me, Dr. Hamza, what should we do with this girl? Your mother was snarling. A man should know when to keep his distance from a woman. I do. I've learned there are times when only other women should touch a woman. That's why I called the women over, and they called other women. They wove a web of whispers around your mother. Passing her from one woman to the next, they used their hands to walk, roll, wheel, and fly her away. First, they washed her. They untangled her hair, which was sticky and clumped together with blood. Foaming their hands with olive oil soap, they rubbed the foam all across her chest, washing her as they would a child. They got water and poured it over her. In a language she didn't understand, they pitied her, loved her, and made her smile. They led her through the doorway of another life by pouring buckets of water over her. Together, they turned your mother back into a full-blossomed woman. They called her back to life. Your mother was like a pebble at first, the type of pebble no one in the camp had seen before. Before, She'd gone completely still. Even her blood had gone still. Women know how to deal with this kind of thing. Warming the blood with their hands, they can make it flow again. Women don't learn how to do this. They're born with this knowledge in the palms of their hands. That's why little girls are always looking for something to, something to take care of. Then they combed her hair. I think women heal each other through their hair, Filipina. Focusing on each strand, on each tip, they formed a circle of healing. I watched them comb your mother's long black hair, holding it and untangling it as though they were brushing or out her thoughts. Maybe that's why, throughout history, women who wanted to destroy other women start by cutting off their hair. They know that a hairless woman has nothing to hold on to and therefore can thrive. They gave her the soap-scented black pants and yellow sweater of a young girl who'd recently died. The pants hung loose around her thighs, and the sweater was too long on one side and too short on the other. But that day, I realized that there is no place more kissable on a woman than her wet hair, newly combed and shiny from being washed, falling on either side of her face. I also realized that day, for the first time, how, I try, how tired I was of the war, which I'd witnessed through the thousands of patients, pass, patients passing through my clinic. It's in hospitals that one truly understands war, Filipina. The hospital is the front, not of fighting men, but of men who've lost, not of men, but of the vestiges of men. It's a tragic sight because no one is fighting anymore. It's not the wounds or the blood. It's not even the helplessness or the incisions administered without painkillers. Men who've given up on fighting are much scarier than fighters. Their nakedness, their barefootedness, and the nightmares that haunt them behind closed eyes are what make hospitals the war's scariest fronts. It seems to me they'd feel more triumphed if they could die in their military fatigues and boots. This front, 
where pain can finally be felt is the war's bloodiest front. front. You wouldn't want to see it. Men scream more in this front, where everyone is trying to heal, than in the one where they're trying to kill each other. It was the, this front's general, General Dr. Hamza. The men under my command were missing an arm or a leg. When the next day your mother stood in the doorway of this bizarre battleground and said, good morning, I wanted to laugh. Because, Filipina, your mother spoke English just like a Palestinian. Like us, she'd learned English in order to express herself, and like us, she belonged to a people who had never expressed themselves. That's why she always looked like a little angry, a little angry when she spoke English and why she scrolled when she stood in the clinic's doorway that morning and followed her good morning with me with gimme work. We troubled peoples, we troubled peoples don't know the English language subtle, re refined and polite words. So when we meet someone from a people as troubled as ours, who can sympathize when we struggle to fill in the blanks of a strange language with coarse seeming words, we have no choice but to love them. Thank you so much to Eche Tamerka, and, and that was the Sounds of Bananas. It was translated by um, Denise Perrin, and um, it was nominated by the Free Word Centre in London, and they're doing a lot of really important work at the moment with Turkish translation. Turkish literature, as you probably know, is undergoing a boom at the moment, and I do hope that um, you all read more widely. It is, can you believe it, the end of the evening? Um, <laughs> I know we've overrun a little bit, but I don't think we have actually overrun. We started late, and we've made sure that each writer has had their um, allocated length of time. So thank you so much to everyone. Congratulations to all the writers, to Birgit van der Becker, Norbert Gestrein, Jakob Toppel, Jordi Punti, Miha Mazzini, Erwin Mortier, Frank Westermann, and Ece Temelkoran. And thank you to all of you so much. Do come outside. The books are on sale. Foils has just been nominated, been awarded National Bookseller of the Year um, at the Bookseller Industry Awards on Monday. So do go out and buy books from Foils um, and get them signed by the authors and also um, have a drink on the Spanish Embassy. Thank you so much to all of you for coming. <laughs>